Thank you so much. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, you guys all, I hope, got the readings. Um, and, you know, it, the reading, the readings were just me selecting out a bunch of passages from the Book of Disquiet, which is like normally you would think kind of an obnoxious thing to do to a text. I mean, to just pull passages, like even a text, like even something like Nietzsche's aphorisms or Wittgenstein or whatever, it's like, or whatever. hey, there's some kind of order and you can't just pull what you want and just create your own, choose your own adventure of a text. But this is actually an exceptional text in which you can do that because what happened, Pessoa was a guy who basically didn't publish anything his whole life. Um, that's not exactly true. He published some things in newspapers. A few of his poems got published. He published a book of poems under very weird circumstances as part of a kind of a nationalist Portugal competition close to the end of his life because he thought he was going to win the competition and then he didn't. Um, but basically, he didn't publish. What he did was write a bunch of stuff on like the backs of, you know, receipts on like the margins of newspapers, whatever, and he put it in a trunk. Uh, and uh, and that's, and what we have is there's like a sheaf of papers and that's the book of disquiet. And so it is constituted anew by every editor, not just in how they translate it and what order they put it, but what they include in it, right? Because there are many bits and pieces of paper that could be part of it or not. Uh, on top of that, it's not even written by Pessoa. Um, it's, uh, it's written by one of Pessoa, well, two of Pessoa's heteronyms. It's not even written by one author. He, he starts by writing uh, as a heteronym. Pessoa had these sort of um, uh, fictional personalities that he made up. They're like, I think of them as imaginary friends because they date back to his childhood. Um, so they, they really were like, some of them were, um, he had like 50 of them at least. Um, but these sort of imaginary friends or personalities whose voice he assumed when he wrote so, and this text is interesting in that it is written by two of them. The earlier bits are written by this guy whose last name is Gu Vincente Guedes. And uh, the, the later ones are by Bernardo Suarez. So what you saw was Bernardo Suarez on the, on the front of your text. That's the second of the two heteronyms. Pessoa calls him a semi-heteronym because he's so close to Pessoa himself. It's like, you know, Pessoa invented this whole idea of a heteronym and then he's like, no, it doesn't quite fit what I'm... Uh, uh, e even that idea then no longer was, was kind of constraining and no longer fit. So anyway, this is a text where I think you actually can do what I did to it. And I think of that as sort of emblematic about something about Pessoa, which is that he was relying on future editors. Like we wouldn't have Pessoa if we didn't have other people who would sort of help him out by turning the stuff that he wrote into something. Uh, and I put, um, so this is one of the things that interests me about Pessoa is that he's an incomplete author. And I think he didn't get to the bottom of his own thoughts. I mean, maybe nobody ever does, but he really didn't. Um, he, he starts a bunch of threads of thought. And so that's very enticing to the reader um, that you can participate in. That. Ryan, can you, or maybe I can mute you. Oh yeah, I can mute people, okay. Um, uh, so, um, so part of what draws me is that I get to be like the other half of Pesso when I'm reading Pesso and I get to complete a bunch of thoughts. And, um, you know, there's this one, there's one passage, uh, this is the most annoying thing I could possibly do. I gave you this list of passages and then, and now I'm like, oh, I wish I had given them and I put it in the chat, but probably, uh, many of you were not here then. Uh, I wish I'd given them 441. Uh, so, um. That's the real problem when you try to find like good excerpts from a text. You wish like, oh, why not that one? Why not that one? Why not that one? Yeah, I know. And well, it's like you, I, I, I was happy with what I chose, except for maybe I can screen share. Um, let me, let me try and do that. Uh, see if this works. Okay. Can you guys see 441 right here? Yeah. Okay, good. I, I want to read this to you. 
High in the nocturnal solitude, an anonymous lamp flourishes behind a window. All else that I see in the city is dark, save where feeble reflections of light hazily ascend from the streets and cause a pallid inverse moonlight to hover here and there. The building's various colors or shades of colors are hardly distinguishable in the blackness of the night. Only vague, seemingly abstract differences break the regularity of the congested ensemble. An invisible thread links me to the unknown owner of the lamp. It's not the mutual circumstance of us both being awake. In this, there can be no reciprocity for my window is dark so that he cannot see me. It's something else, something all my own that's related to my feeling of isolation that participates in the night and in the silence and that chooses the lamp as an anchor because it's the only anchor there is. It seems to be it's glowing that makes the night so dark. It seems to be the fact that I'm awake dreaming in the dark that makes the lamp shine. So I, so I just read a biography of Pessoa in which the, uh, the author of the biography makes much of this passage rightly, it's wonderful. Um, but what he sort of says is like, this is, this is written relatively late in Pessoa's life and it's Pessoa acknowledging his own sort of um, status as kind of a weirdo, as one of the world, as he's one of the world's solitary, ill-adapted and invisible people. And that he's identifying with this community of weirdos. This is not how I read this passage. Um, I, I don't read it spatially, I read it temporally. Like Pessoa, there's this like lamp, there's this person out there and like they can't see each other. Um, and, you know, Pessoa has this kind of desperate need to be social and to participate in a life with others. But as we read in a lot of the passages, he somehow can't do it. He can't break through this wall that connects him to other people or rather, he, when he does it, he does it via imaginary people. He consumes those people and they become part of himself, right? So there's this problem with being social. And he sort of, his works are themselves this kind of weird social act where I feel like he's reaching out to future people and be like, being like, I can't see you and you can't quite see me. There isn't this reciprocity, but um, help me out. <laughs> um, make me speak, make me say all the things I kind of half tried to say. Um, okay, so, um, I'm still not, I wanted to put this in the chat, but somehow, but um, hold on. There we go, okay. So now it's in the chat too, if you wanna look at it again. Um, so that's what draws me. Now, let me say what, I'm gonna say one of the ideas that really interests me in Pessoa, um, that like one of the ideas that I wanna complete. <laughs> Um, and then uh, I'm gonna go around and I'll just call on you in the order that you appear on my screen. Okay, so I think this idea, the best expression of it is in passage 10 that I assigned you. Um, and I'm not gonna put it on the screen, but I'm just gonna assume you guys have your text with you. Okay. Yeah, um, so it's where he says that he's not capable of a sentiment that endures. and that everything that everything in him tends to go on to become something else. Um, and he associates this with the dreaming. Uh, and he says he can't listen to people in conversations. Like when he hears people talking, if people are talking to him, it's like the words are like passing him by because he can't hold, he can't hold on to the words long enough to like put together meaning. But he can remember with perfect detail the muscles in the person's face that like for their facial expression. Okay, so here's what strikes me about this. It's like, Pessoa is involved in a conversation with someone, right? He's talking to someone. He was a famous conversationalist, okay? He would sit at cafes and just wait and people would come and talk to him. Um, that's kind of how he spent a lot of his life um, for all of his sort of antisocial rhetoric in this piece. He was a very, in that way, a very social guy. Um, and what he is, he is having this conversation and he is taking in the wrong sense experiences, right? He's focusing on the facial muscles of the person he's talking to. And he's like, ah, I'm not, I'm supposed to be listening to the words, not looking at the facial muscles, but I can't force my brain to take in this bit of information and not this bit of information. Somehow I'm taking in all the information or I, and I'm focusing in the wrong place and I can't control that. And that, that predicament, of um, not really being able to forcibly organize one's own sense experience. For Pessoa is, he associates that with dreaming. 
And at some points in his text, he kind of seems to accept that, that that's like the truth of life that we are dreaming. Uh, at some points he's like, I, you know, he, he, he longs to be able to do this thing where you give an order to your sense experience. Um, uh, at some points, it seems to me that he is, it's like he escapes from it. There's a passage in here where he talks about waking up and like finding the reality, right? But there's a kind of, um, a kind of skeptical um, framework with which he's approaching the world, like as if life were a dream, right? Where that idea of skepticism is very, you know, popular in philosophy as a, as an interlocutor, we're often, we're often talking to the skeptic. If we're reading Descartes, we're talking to the skeptic, right? And we're trying to justify to the skeptic our claim that we can have knowledge of the world. But so is the skeptic. He inhabits the point of, he doesn't want to be, he's not trying to be. He inhabits the point of view of the skeptic who finds himself to be dreaming and is like trying to wake himself up. And he's saying skepticism can be found just in the disorder of our sense experiences and in the arbitrariness of focusing on one thing as opposed to another. Okay. So that's one idea that really interests me uh, about this. So I also have a question, but I'm gonna save my question uh, until after I hear some of your questions. Um, so um, Eloy, you're, I'm just gonna be calling on you kind of out of the blue because you don't know what order you are on my screen. I'm sorry about that. Um, but can you start, tell us who you are and give us a question. Oh, wow, um, the first one. Um, oh, hello, my name is Eloy. Um, I... I'm very grateful to be here. Um, one of the interests I have in Pessoa is, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm very being very basic about it, but the thing is that the language is just incredible. Um, and just linking to just what you were saying, there's, there's a passage in, in Pessoa that says that civilization is trying to make, is, is, I was trying to look it up before you called on me, so I'm sorry <laughs> about that. Um, but civilization is pretty much uh, born out of little misunderstandings. Um, and that pretty much, like, that is pretty early in the, in the book. And it struck me because it makes so much sense out of the little interactions that we make um, and how we talk about things and how those, sometimes there's a lot of meaning that comes about from those little misunderstandings that we are trying to always, after, after the fact, trying to fix them and trying to make meaning out of that. Um, so in that sense, I do agree with the, with the vision of the skeptic of, of, of Pessoa being the guy that is trying to put um, some sort of meaning in terms of those um, spaces that we have. I think it was Rilke that said something about how about the, in, the about even between the closest people, they're like, there's a lot of an infinite spaces and he's trying to put some sort of content into that. Um, and just the way that he's trying to do so in terms of the language that he uses, uh, it just interested me. So I'm sorry if that's too much of a focus on the text and not on the meaning behind the text, but it, was, it just struck me. That's great, thanks. Nigel. Hi, Nigel, by the way. <laughs> oh, you're muted. So I was just trying to find the unmute. Hi, hi, um, I'm Nigel. Um, I'm a podcaster and writer and philosopher. Um, and I've got my interest in Pessoa comes from having been to Lisbon quite often. And um, everybody talks about Pessoa in Lisbon. And, and I felt really ignorant not having read um, the Book of Disquiet. So I read it and then completely forgot it. So my, um, my experience of reading Pessoa is, is as fragmentary as the, some of the personae. And I just, if somebody asks me what it's about, I can never remember a line or a, I can remember the image of the of the lamp that you had just now, but I find it very difficult to pull things together. Um, but I have a sense of a mood and um, of wisdom. Um, the question I have, which comes up in a way from the passage that you had about the lamp, was about saying versus showing. Because sometimes the persona tells us stuff and sometimes the persona shows us stuff and I felt, for instance, in that passage, the, the description of what it's like to see a lamp in, in another house was about, was, was showing us something. It wasn't, it, it wasn't just describing what he can see. He's, he's trying to sort of gesture at what experience is really like and mm -hmm. gradually coming into kind of more abstract thinking about it. It starts off very 
um, phenomenological and then moves into this more interesting speculative stuff about human relationships. But I, the relationship between showing and saying is the thing that fascinates me, as with Kierkegaard here. Thanks. Rick. Hi all, uh, I'm a philosophy professor, uh, somehow find myself in Kansas City of all places. Um, I've been reading Pessoa for a long time and a Portuguese friend in London turned me on to him and I always found the poems themselves, you know, quite amazing and fascinating. Uh, I've been reading poetry for a long time, but as a philosopher, it's, my question is not so much specific as general. I guess since at least Hume people have been, uh, philosophers have questioned the notion that there is such a thing as the self. And so what I find so fascinating about the poems in particular is that these different heteronyms really, when you read the poems, when you read lots of the poems, they really seem as if they're written by genuinely different people. And so I'm, I'm super interested philosophically and poetically in um, the notion of a fractured self or the lack of a self whatsoever and the way that this plays out in the different poems. Uh, so yeah, I've, I've long had this kind of an overarching sort of philosophical issue with the self or the lack thereof, and the way that he seems to exploit this, um, perhaps even gives fuel fuel to this. Uh, so yeah, I guess that would be it for now. Cool. Paul. Hi, I'm Paul, I'm, uh, I'm a lawyer. I'm uh, in Portland, Oregon, which is on the west coast of the United States, Northwest. Um, I've been reading Pessoa for quite a long time as well. First stumbled upon him when I was actually in Portugal and found out about him. We visited his house, saw the fake trunk they have there of his papers. Um, I think what's really wonderful about him is you can't really pin him down. There's no root idea. There's no fundamental idea except, except for the heteronyms. Um, the poetry is as good as the prose, but the Book of Disquiet is an amazing book that um, I doubt um, I don't think everyone would like it. And there's been some discussion on other groups like this about whether people can even discuss it adequately on a Zoom call. I think that's a good question, but so far you're doing a good job. <laughs> um, but I think what I really like about him is that he actually can't be pinned down very well. And every time you dip into his stuff, you find something new. And I think that reflects a little bit the passage you, re you read, that the lamp can represent lots of different things. Um, so his, his stuff is beautiful um, and, and pretty fascinating. So I'm happy to be here. Thanks. Tyler. Hello, I'm Tyler. I've been reading Pessoa for quite some time. One thing I like about him is the implied suggestion that somehow we're all doing philosophy on absolutely the wrong scale and that the scale uh, in which you ought to think is up for grabs and don't take for granted that what you think of as the common sense level of scale or your common sense world is the right uh, way to approach anything philo philosophical. And I suppose my question for you today is if we grant that Pessoa is a philosopher as you're trying to argue, uh, what does his work imply for your own views as to whether there is indeed progress in philosophy? Okay, Ben. Uh, hello, um, I'm I'm Ben. Uh, I work part time as a as a personal trainer, part time doing backstage stuff at the II. So you've probably all received emails from me at some point. Um, I'm generally not a poetry guy. Um, so uh, I'm kind of more of a kind of practice uh, and, and the kind of philosophy of self and motivation and that kind of stuff. That's where I kind of get into this. And like, um, but the reading through the readings, it's like there's a lot of, there's more kind of questions than statements in the, in the, in the kind of language. And that kind of, that got me, thinking he, 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 he kind of has this disconnect between that kind of uh, experienced self from behind your eyes kind of thing and and the actual substance of, of reality and he, he he's kind of constantly questioning that substance and um, 
and yeah that that really stood out to me at, at the thing and, and just yeah you, you said he's kind of this the skeptic and uh, i think that really shows up um which i guess kind of makes him a good philosopher in that sense but there's there there feels i can feel that disconnect between between the two things whereas i personally uh, don't do as much kind of disconnected questioning in my own thought and and uh, get involved in the in the practice as as my main kind of way of thinking. So the the sort of um, that 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 sort of disconnected questioning inquiry that's that in that poetic sense um, kind of stood out to me. Yeah, there's something unstable about reading him. I think it's not even just questioning. It's like so that 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 passage 10 that I was citing where he's like there I can't stand still and you feel that with his thought too I think and in reading mm. it, like there's no there's there's no point of stability where you can no, yeah yeah exactly Ryan oh hi um <clears throat> really glad to be here my name is Brian Cam uh, I'm a writer based in London um I'm also an I I host um I don't know Pessoa at all, actually. So um, this is my first encounter with him, and I read some poetry alongside it. Um, he really reminded me of the Russians, like um, in particular, uh, just the tone of it reminds me a lot of Dostoevsky's like Underground Man and White Knights and things like that. Just this, and I think it's like the spitefulness of it, or, or I mean, it's partly the sense of like alienation um, from oneself. But but he's not a happy guy, basically. And um, you were reminding me of, um, I think it, I think Tolstoy writes about this like white bear uh, thing, which is like, you can't, you know, if you try not to think of a white bear, um, then you like, you think of a white bear basically. And that remind you reminded me of that with what you were saying about um, just his inability to assert control over his perceptions. Um, and that got me wondering, like, I guess my question would be, do we think like his heteronyms are like actually random or is there like a central tension um i'm also kind of reading ian mcgilchrist's uh the master and his emissary um and without going into the kind of like right left stuff i was thinking about the difference between like awareness and like focused attention and you could say that listening or hearing and listening and comprehension are this kind of automatic um like awareness thing whereas the intense focus on like specific muscles in the face um is like this, I don't know, I was just wondering whether there might be a core tension um, between two sides of, of consciousness, if that makes sense, like between attention and awareness, and it's in that tension that the alienation arises somehow. Um, yeah, so that's my question. <laughs> Thanks. Josh, hey Josh. Hi, uh, Josh Fox? Uh, yes, uh, Josh Fox, sorry, is there more than uh, one? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm a graduate student in philosophy. Um, I guess I, I had a question focused on sort of the very start of the text um, on page one. Uh, we get sort of an explanatory account there, with the suggestion that the reason that uh, the narrator has so much trouble organizing his consciousness, um, the reason that he has a total loss of consciousness, as he puts it, is that he's unable to believe in humanity or in God. Um, and I just was, I guess I wasn't entirely clear in sort of how that explanatory account works, how a failure to believe in humanity or God causes this uh, hyper-consciousness that's causing problems throughout the rest of the text. Josh, when I was reading that this time, I was thinking of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm gonna very just very quickly say something to Josh before I forget this. I like a super quick answer is that there's some kind of top down way of organizing everything that happens to you that everybody else seems to have available to them. That Pessoa is like, I don't have it. So that'd be like the quick answer would be like right. that that's what the concept of humanity or God would be doing. But I think there's a lot more to say about that. That's a great question. Abe. Uh, hi, I'm Abe. Um, uh, I guess from the reading that we did uh, just for this, um, I don't feel that I really understand Pessoa. So my question is somewhat basic. Um, my question is, how can we reconcile 
his belief that thinking is the highest human activity and that the thinker uh, or the, the dreamer, as he also puts it, is like the happiest and the best kind of person with his belief that thinking is ultimately futile and that, uh, as he puts it, to think is to not know how to be and that it's kind of a pointless activity without, I should say, resorting to like nihilism and just accepting contradictions. Great question. Um, that I'll add just to Abe's question that, that that relates to a passage I wanted to ask you all about, which was sort of my question is, he draws a distinction in that first passage between the person who, the prisoner who weaves straw and the, the woman who embroiders. And he's like, I'm not at all like the prisoner who weaves straw. I'm like the woman who embroiders. And I myself, I'm just like, what is the difference? What is this kind of way of using thought that is somehow some, in some way supposed to be good? Um, so I definitely want us to talk about that. Anna, you're up. Hi, um, my name is Anna. I'm the founder of Intransect. Thank you so much for being here. Um, this is super interesting. I'm, it, those, of, those of you who come to my salons know that I'm a bit obsessed with the fragmentation of self question. Um, and this partly just stems from the fact that um, reading Dark Parfit was a bit of a revelation for me when I was younger. Um, but also that, you know, I'm a person who has lived many lives and I live many life, lives, at, you know, all at once as well. Um, and so the continuity of the self is kind of a never ending interest to me. Um, but what really strikes me here is that um, I went to Lisbon a couple of months ago for the first time in my life. Uh, and was really struck by the personal cult around Pessoa there. Um, and so we clearly assigned to this guy a very coherent self, even though he didn't assign it to himself. And I think in many ways, you know, celebrities, even those who don't extensively write about this question, are interesting case studies because they show that, you know, maybe the coherence of the self is something that we demand of each other. Uh, rather than kind of on ourselves, right? It's scary when you know somebody and they suddenly exhibit a completely new self. Uh, and so my question to you is, you know, is this something we do for ourselves? We limit um, the array of selves we have at our avail at all times to as kind of a favor? Um, or is it something that, you know, in fact, and in, in reality carries some kind of a moral, um, you know, um, a question of integrity or a, you know, a, a moral quality that is desirable. Nigel, you brought up Kierkegaard, you know, the responsibility, like always being able to answer why, why you did something. Uh, is that really good? Or can we just be this ball pool of, you know, little puppies wrapped in one, into one body? Yeah, great. Yeah, could all of us encounter the multiple selves problem diachronically somehow Pessoa really faced it synchronically, you know, at one, at one time he was many people. Um, he, had, he encountered less of it diachronically than most of us. His life was pretty uneventful. Once he was past his teenage years, almost nothing happened to him physically. He lived in Lisbon, never traveled. Um, but um, uh, yeah, Peter. Uh, hello everybody. Um, I'm Peter. I'm a software developer. Um, I'm coming to Pacella kind of fresh um, on the recommendation of uh, my favorite economist. Um, read, from the reading, uh, I had sort of five words that jumped out at me. Uh, it was the sentence, to, to understand I destroyed myself. And this made me think of Nietzsche, who you know I, I read a fair bit of a, a while ago. And the thing that most struck me about Nietzsche was you know, his really extreme dedication to kind of intellectual conscience, to like very clear-sighted sort of truth seeking. And then his realization that at a certain point, this kind of commitment taken to an extreme becomes very problematic, perhaps even sort of crippling. Um, and, I, and so I, I think my, I'm interested in, in sort of reading Pessoa perhaps, you know, through, through that lens, uh, or at least that, that that's where I'm, that's the thing that sort of happened to me as I as I read it this things for the first time and so I, I sort of I'm curious about how he's maybe struggling with you know a, a certain commitment to kind of observing it, like paying it like paying extreme attention so a, a certain kind of intellectual sort of integrity and, and honesty um and then also but but then sort of yeah perhaps 
you know struggling to to be a to live with that um yeah I feel so like yeah really the other side of what anna said right so there's this sense of oh this liberation of being multiple selves and then on the other hand it's like really self-destructive and uh kind right. of miserable too right it's so like um is it having multiple selves or is it having no selves i guess would be one way to put that question eric Yeah, hi, I'm Eric. And uh, my question was with uh, section 111 or page 111, um, where he's talking about love. I thought that was really interesting and it kind of shook me. I think a lot about love, but I guess not enough or heaven. It's, it's, it was a nice humbling experience. Um, my question is, is this problem of love that it presumes self and an other or that it only has one thing um and how does that kind of relate to the themes of loneliness and isolation and i felt my my heart crying out for pessoa in this me too i have that feeling a lot when i read pessoa i don't know that there's any other author that makes me feel so much like I wish I could stretch across. I wish I'd been born a hundred years earlier in a different place, you know? He was a deeply lonely person and he expresses it so with such articulation. Um, and I think you're right. I think here, you know, he's sort of, he's sort of saying, um, love is just an image you have of the other person. Like there's this desperate need to reach out to the other person, but then there's this thought that all they are is just more stuff in your head, right? It's sort of like, how does the skeptic think about love? That'd be one way to put that question. It's an important question. Ryan, hey, Ryan. Hi, uh, I'm a college student. And my question is about the relationship between forgetting and abdicating in Pessoa's thought. Um, it seems like one of them is a good thing and the other is also a good thing, but in very different ways. And I'm not sure if they can be done at the same time. And I just want to hear more about that. Yeah, I, I, I also think that's related to the embroidering versus weaving. I think that's somehow the distinction he's getting at there. Uh, I find it puzzling too. Chloe. Hi. Um, I am, or <laughs> I was a would-be philosophy grad student, but sometime in writing a PhD application, I went to India and have been teaching yoga instead for the last three years. <laughs> Everyone's nodding like, yeah, makes sense. <laughs> um, I'm pretty new to Pessoa. Uh, a couple of years ago, I read the Nick Cave lecture, The Word Made Flesh, and he talks a bit about Pessoa and how language can be a salve to longing, a poultice to the wounds incurred in separation. And that piqued my curiosity, so I bought the books and never read them <laughs> until in preparation for this. Um, in the reading you gave us, I think it was in 31, Pessoa says, like, my physical heart was physically oppressed by an almost forgotten memory. And I just thought, wow, that is a really intriguing continuum of materiality and the ethereal. So I'm interested in how Pessoa skates between mind and body. The kind of his pseudonyms, his heteronyms thing fascinates me because in um, there's, there's this one line from like the philosophical text of yoga rather than physical instructions for postures. And it says uh, the yogi can create duplicate minds and artificial minds. And this proceeds from their sense of being alone. And to me, that's like a really abstract kind of obscure line of philosophy. And Pessoa is the closest thing I've ever come across <laughs> that maybe speaks to what is in that text. Mm. Amy. Hi, um, I uh, just finished a graduate program um, at Duke, not in philosophy and beyond that, uh, it's to be decided who I am, what I am, what I'm doing. 
Um, but I found Pessoa uh, in lockdown, like just this last year through a Portuguese friend. And he um, fascinates me a lot. I love the way that he talks about um, such heavy things and articulates them so well, but often he does it in a way that can be so like absurd and dramatic that I just can't help but sort of laugh, you know, laugh about it or laugh at him and just find it, you know, funny. And so um, I really enjoy the way he's able to kind of uh, bring that to these, you know, sometimes these really, you know, almost dark insights. Um, and one question that sort of came up for me as I was reading was it just made me so curious to understand Pessoa better um, as a person and in his personal life and and this topic of, you know, the prisoner weaving straw versus the girl embroidering pillows has come up a couple times and it. Um, he seems to kind of suggest that he's more like the girl embroidering the pillows and he's, you know, writing these things and creating these things from a place of, you know, enjoyment and being a dreamer um, and being just sort of idle. Um, and, and I wonder, how true that is or or if it's you know sort of truer that he's writing this kind of thing you know as more of a catharsis and because he's like this tortured soul and kind of and it, it just made me so curious about you know does he shift between those two places or is he really this tortured soul who's like trying to find him you know find some way into um a more enjoyable uh, way of living and it made me very curious about you know what you know, what has formed him, if it comes from, you know, some deep traumas or something, especially with the splitting of personalities and the, the, the daydreaming that he's so immersed in can, you know, be a trauma response. And so it, it just made me so curious about, you know, him as a person and, and um, yeah, how dark or light of a person he is or how much he's enjoying this work that he's creating for us or, um, or, you know, really doing it from a place of sort of need and pain. Yeah, You're, you'll really like the new biography that's just, it's gonna come out in July. If you wanna know about Purcell as a person, it's a thousand pages on Purcell as a person and not that much happened in his life. So that's a lot. <laughs> Perfect. Han, hi. Yeah, hi everybody. I'm Han. I teach uh, comparative literature, and my main beat is uh, pre-modern Chinese poetry. So, you know, I'm at home in the eighth century, and further beyond. Um, one of the things that attracts me to Pessoa is that he, he's kind of a refusal of the assumption that we make about poetry that it's a lyric utterance from somebody who is giving voice to some emotion. Uh, I noticed that, you know, in my own history, I've mostly been drawn to texts that don't have an author, right, like uh, the Homeric poems or the Chinese Book of Songs or oral literature. And of course, when we say they don't have an author, what we really mean is that they have many authors and they just haven't left their names behind. And so Pessoa is, you know, he's a modern person. He's writing in the age of print. Everything is signed, but he's somehow suspicious of our assumption that knowing who wrote this thing will tell us what it means. And that seems to be part of his reason for generating these other personas. And I just want to um, let you know about this. Uh, I have one edition of Pessoa in Portuguese, which is very frustrating because it presents every poem strictly chronologically in terms of Pessoa's life and collections like the Book of Disquiet are not presented as such, right? So it's as if it dissolves his whole uh, inquiry about human personality into one single stream and makes it very hard to recover. <laughs> so anyway, um, you know, there's, there's my reason for being fascinated by Pessoa and reason for being frustrated with some of the great philological work that people have done. This is an edition that was first printed in 1960 and has had about 20 reprints since. So it's obviously significant, but it seems to be to be saying the wrong thing about the poetry or not taking seriously enough one of the things that the poet thought was important about the poetry. So there you go. It, it, it illustrates, I think, a certain kind of irony, right? Which is that the, you know, um, the independence of the poetic work from the poet is not bought so cheaply, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a way in which Pessoa 
landed himself in the opposite position from what he wanted um, by having such an incoherent self um, his artwork somehow become this just record of himself. Um, so yeah. It's, yeah. I, Banksy is one person who's managed to do what he couldn't quite do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Derek. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Derek. I'm a grad student, student in philosophy from Poland, I spent my time uh, in, well, partly in Berlin and in Amsterdam and in Groningen, which is in the north. I, um, well, I consider myself some kind of unofficial student uh, of Agnes. <laughs> I met her um, in Oxford and later in Oslo. And well, I decided to read everything she uh, she recommends. And I think at some point Agnes said that Pessoa is the, um, what did you say Agnes somewhere? He should, he's a philosopher, although people don't know he's a philosopher somewhere, right? Um, and then I started reading uh, Pesso, uh, uh, it's been a year ago, I guess. And um, yeah, so, well, I, I, Agnes quoted me in the, uh, on the website. Um, so what interests me most in, in Pesso, I guess, is the, um, the kind of introspective skepticism we find. So I come from, um, from ancient philosophy, I, I work on Plato, and I'm, well, I, I've been thinking about the possibility of being mistaken about whether we are experiencing pleasure or the possibility of being mistaken about certain emotions. And then when, when I read Pessoa, I just, uh, well, I just discovered someone who just, uh, who's not arrogant about introspection. So there's, there are many passages where he's, uh, uh, he doesn't take it for granted that when you, you think you are experiencing pleasure, you're, you're necessarily right. So, um, that's, I guess, one of the main strands I find most interesting. Um, yeah, besides, I also have a strong interest in, uh, in psychedelic science. I, I received some training in psychology. I'm very interested in psychedelic therapy. And um, I have a sense that Pesso, in some sense, he, he describes some kind of altered state. I guess this ties in with the, uh, the earlier remark about yoga. So my question is very basic. It's just, what kind of altered state is 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 this guy in, and um, what does he mean by dreaming? Is is so? At some points he just seems to describe some kind of new altered state by dreaming. So I'm just yeah, that would be my question. Great, yeah, and I had wanted to bring this up with, with what Chloe said too. It's, there's both the state of dreaming, but there's also the idea that the altered state is the state of waking up, right? Mm. And there's one passage that I gave you guys where he's like he wakes up for a short time and he says for a short time I was what great men are their whole lives um where he sees reality but he's somehow not part of it he, he somehow has erased himself so there, there is also a question of which is the altered state is it the dreaming or is it the the brief alternative that he experiences uh IJK is what you have on your <laughs> hello uh I'm Irene Irene Yes, I'm based in London and I'm a freelance consultant and also an II host. And uh, my interaction with Pessoa has primarily been in poetry. And uh, some of uh, his poetry is really beautiful. Uh, the question that I had was, how did he manage, while he was writing uh, under so many heteronyms, how did, did he have conflicts? And if so, how did he kind of manage that? Can I just very quick, I'm just very quickly say, he, he sure. managed it by like having them fight sometimes. So sometimes they, they criticize him, they insult him, right? Um, he also stages like meetings between himself and his heteronyms written by other heteronyms of himself. So he'll write an essay under one heteronym about the time that Cairo met Pessoa, obviously these people never met because they, you know, but they, they meet in the pages of his own texts. So he's quite, uh, they have quite different and very distinct outlooks and he, and they are quite harsh with each other. Isabella. Hi, um, yeah, I'm Isabella and I'm a, uh, I'm a professor in developmental psychology, uh, transitioning out of full-time academia into some other or several other selves, hopefully, um, keeping one foot in uh, still, hopefully. And so I've got, I, I'm, 
Jullie zouden toch om tien uur komen? Oh, that's Dutch, so I know that it must be who just spoke. <laughs> I yeah. used to be in the Netherlands, and that's why I can tell. <laughs> um, so I'm now in Toronto and just moved here. And so I, I'm totally new to Pessoa, and I, I cannot understand how I've screwed it uh, meeting his work because I um, read a lot of poetry and care a lot about poetry. And um, I think about both fiction and poetry as uh superior means to understand the human condition and um our identities and changes in those identities and selves rather than most of what con conventional psychology uh, or at least currently instantiated uh conventional psychology gives us and so my interests were a, a, a few things and my questions are sort of around the this multiple cells um so from a psychology perspective i've written a lot about thinking about these multiple cells and whether the act of creating coherence is basically the most important one of our sort of identity task and how to do that and it seems to me what what i struggled with so is that he seems to be quite nihilistic or professes to be this um, at some times. And yet, first of all, the fact that his writing is so beautiful almost undermines that immediately. But also it's really clear that he's using narrative as a way of finding coherence, explicitly working through these personas. And even the fact that they their meeting is a very kind of classic uh, internal family systems kind of um, way of providing coherence in your identity, having these multiple selves meet and work through values and perceptions of the world and so on. So it feels to me like it's the process by which he goes through while he's writing is a is sort of a beautiful one to start analyze further. And I just want to spend a lot more time figuring out in what places he feels satisfied that he's done something that does bring some kind of temporal coherence at least, and then some level of, of yeah, satisfaction, because he doesn't seem satisfied at all or happy at all. And the one other thing that I was thinking about is that he, he seems to write sometimes in these beautifully detailed ways that you've already described, several people have described. And I think of Simone, Simone Veal, Veal, I can never know how to pronounce her last name, um, the philosopher who really talked about the superiority of attention over the will um, to, as a tool of self-transformation, right? And so he seen, when he does that, when he seems to attend in this micro cost, you know, micro way, it feels he gets a lot closer to this sense of um, something authentic as opposed to this kind of willing himself to be mean or to look at things in a really quite negative way. I don't know if that's making much coherent sense, because like I said, I'm still working through it, but I'm very excited about just going back to the text and really reading his poetry now. So thank you for introducing me. Yeah, that's a great contrast with Vey. I think that she has a lot more faith in the idea that attention leads you somewhere, somewhere specific than uh, Pessoa does. And I wanted to say about the narrative, I mean, to me, the odd thing about the Book of Disquiet is that it has no, basically no narrative component. He says, it's my factless autobiography, right? And so there's something like, there's actually something really, it's interesting that, I mean, Pessoa started a bunch of novels. I don't think he finished any of them. He, he translated a bunch of stuff, um, but there's something unnarratival about Pessoa's whole, whole life. Like it's hard to tell the story of it. It could have been a 3000 page uh, biography, I think. But it's interesting that he tries. It's more of the trying that I'm really interested in, that this, this, mm. this energy towards that trying that I think we all or often find ourselves in. Whether he's successful or not is almost less interesting to me, the fact that he's actually willing to try and keep trying and failing, apparently. Michael, Michael Newman. Hi, hi, I'm, I'm Michael, I'm based in London. Um, I teach in the art department at uh, Goldsmiths University and before I went back into teaching in relation to art. I was working in philosophy and did research at the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium around memory, trace, and the other. So very, very interested in, in Peshoa. Um, and uh, I was particularly struck by that passage, Agnes, that you drew attention to about the nocturnal solitude and, and the lamp, because it really struck a chord with me um, concerning my experience of nighttime walks under lockdown. 
where, you know, as a, somebody who lives in isolation, you are sort of seeing people's windows but, and lamps, but unable to actually uh, engage with them. So, uh, you know, that raises the question of, of sort of isolation, I think, and, and Peshoa's uh, isolation. And what interests me a lot is what is the relationship between Peshoa's experience of isolation and his heteronyms and uh, multiple personae. And by one of those sort of amazing serendipities, um, I'm reading at the moment uh, writings by and on a French philosopher, Gilbert Simondon. And Gilbert Simondon wrote about individuation and technicity uh, as separate and also as related to each other. And uh, his idea about individuation is that, you know, all philosophy practically until him more or less and with some precursors have started from the point of view of the individual and then looked for the, you know, the uh, constituting conditions for the individual. And he says, no, you must start with the process of individuation as becoming in order to then understand the individual as a phase, which is who is al always a phase that's always unfinished, that's always in process, and that is related to a process of what he calls trans individuation, which includes a relationship to the pre individual and a relationship to others. And in the passages I was reading, he has this amazing discussion of Nietzsche, who has already been mentioned, and particularly the passage in Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra, where uh, you have the tightrope walker, the tightrope walker who falls to his death. It's a fam famous passage. It's also the moment of Zarathustra coming out of his solitude. So Simonon's question then is, what is the role of solitude? What is the role of solitude and isolation? And how he understands it, which is, I think, rather different to the way that it's been understood, is that he sees this moment of solitude and withdrawal into solitude as a necessary destruction of the individual in order that the individuation as a process can emerge and also individuation as a process involving, involving others. Um, if it doesn't kind of, if it doesn't, uh, you know, if it doesn't develop fully in that direction, if one remains isolated, what Simondon then says, talking about the uh, French uh, psychologist Pierre Janet, he draws from him the idea of multiple pers pers personalities, is that the multiple personalities become the stand-in for the others involved in the process of trans-individuation. So it's an attempt to sort of perform trans-individuation from the position of oneself um, uh, in that moment, you know, as, as it were, perhaps even coming out of that moment of isolation, but, but in a sense, you're, you're blocked from socially coming out of that moment. So it becomes a sort of fictional and phantasmatic multiplication. That, so that, that, that I thought was kind of amazing. I was just reading that this morning. <laughs> and, you know, here we are talking about Peshoa, who seems to, you know, it seems to that seems to be very much the process that he's he's going through. So I think, you know, one way of thinking about him is not like, you know, it's a defective form of the individual, but it's a ne necessary destruction of the individual that is taking place in the same way as happens in Nietzsche's uh, Thus spoke Zarathustra and happens with many other, I think, writers and artists and, uh, and poets in the, you know, in, in the later 19th and, and, and earlier, uh, earlier 20th century. That's super interesting. So, so, those are my thoughts. <laughs> um, you know, I, when you were talking, I was thinking of that passage about how I gave birth to myself by pulling myself out of myself with forceps. Yeah. Um, 
And when I read that passage, I thought to myself, it's a little, you, you said a little too much, but so I don't think you fully gave birth to yourself. I don't think, I think you were never born. Your whole life, you never became fully born. And the thought I had when you were talking, Michael, is that like this idea of individuation, you know, we talk about, well, having one self, having multiple selves, but there's also the idea of the self as a process or as a, like becoming more and more of a self somehow, right? And, um, and I like the idea that the, the inner multiple personalities are somehow part of that process of attempting to give birth to oneself. And I guess that's the thing I find tantalizing about Pessoa is that he's somebody who was attempting to give birth to himself and he didn't quite do it. Like, but he could still be, right? And this is sort of what I guess I would say back to Tyler's question of like progress. I've never met, read anyone who was so dependent on the presupposition that there would be progress as Pessoa. It was like, his whole life is like in a way a kind of gambit, you know? And it's like, I hope somebody shows up and opens this trunk. I hope somebody makes something of this. I hope I get to be born sometime in the future because I didn't get to be born my whole life or something like that. So the, the self can be kind of, um, I don't know, both expansive and partial and partial in that bizarre way. It, it's, a, it's a bizarre form of uh, partial selfhood that I think it's like if there had to be someone who did it in order for us to see that it was possible. Mm -hmm. But of course, you can never give birth to yourself. I mean, giving birth to oneself is impossible. Somebody gives birth to you, you come out of a pre-existing situation. And in a way, the, the idea of giving birth to oneself is a sort of refusal of, of that. I mean, there are also a lot of gender implications, I think there because it's a rather sort of masculine <laughs> idea that you know the artist give, gives birth to themselves that they're dependent on on nothing else and nothing that uh, that precedes them um right, but i think you're right that. that he was never born but he was never born for good reason because he could never give birth to himself <laughs> he always needs others and he tried to create the others from himself that's the <laughs> I mean, it's true that someone gives birth to you, but his thought is that's not you, you know, yet. <laughs> that baby or whatever. He did have, Peso had issues with women. I mean, he basically thought anything that involved or invoked women essentially was kind of gross. Um, but who you so, are is always involved, it always involves your identifications with others. Do you see what I mean? There isn't a pure identity separate from all those multiple identifications. So I guess. Uh, even later on, you're dependent in some sense on that with which you are able to identify. Yeah, Claire. Hi, uh, I'm Claire. I'm a grad student in psychology. And um, I was interested in this passage about absurdity, um, where I think he sort of equates absurdity with contradiction, uh, but especially contradiction within the self. So sort of disagreeing with oneself or thinking something and doing something else. Um, but I've often sort of on the other hand thought of absurdity as a, a contradiction, a form of contradiction between the self and uh, sort of the world or, or seeing contradictions in the world and, and feeling some sort of remove, um, which relates I think in different ways to what he is writing. Um, it's this kind of, you know, being an onlooker or having some kind of remove or alienation. So my question is sort of how those two forms of absurdity relate to one another. And I guess also because I sort of um, think that, you know, you can't think about absurdity without thinking about humor, uh, how sort of humor relates to those two kinds of absurdity and whether there's like a humor inherent in either one of them or, or both of them. Yeah, I, I was very struck by that passage too, because that was, you know, he, he says something, this is the one where he says like, let's buy books so as not to read them right? Where that's one of the moments for me, um, and this is connected to the thing Eric was saying too earlier, where I'm like, it's almost like it's such a, it's such a direct request for a friend, like, let's be in this weird club where we buy books so as not to read them, and we go on walks because we hate walks, and like, we do all the things that we hate, and it's like, he wants someone to do that with, so that it's like, there's a contradiction, but there's also a kind of a creating a space, right, with the person who would do that with him. Um, so yeah, that really, that spoke to me as well. Um, Roberto, I've shifted around a little bit. Hi, I'm Roberto, I'm a filmmaker, I live in New York. This is actually my first uh, intern tonight. Um, me too. I have, 
um, I have an interest in philosophy, but don't study it in any way. Um, more, more of a passerby, passerby, I suppose. Um, and similarly, I have had an interest in Pessoa for a while because of his kind of obsessive use of multiple personas, but I haven't really read much of him. And uh, just from the reading that you, you assigned, there are so many things that I'm curious about. He's, he's clearly a skeptic, but he seems to claim not to be a pessimist. He's also, like Brian said earlier, clearly not happy, but he doesn't seem interested in happiness. I love his idea of, of him sort of stuck in this roadside inn until the coach of the abyss pulls up and takes him away. I think that's beautiful. Um, but one of the, the quotes I pulled from, from the reading that seemed to me like a key to, to trying to understand him is, I envy all people because I'm not them. Since this always seemed to me like the most impossible of all impossibilities, it's what I yearn for every day and despaired of in every sad moment. That makes me think he doesn't just seem to want to be every, anybody else um, or a few other people. He wants to be everybody else. Um, so that's what I'm, I guess that's as close as I could get to a question for you. Ryan. Maybe Ryan can't hear us. Uh, I'll come back to you, Ryan. Sean. Oh, hello. Um, uh, I'm Sean. I'm calling in from New York City. And I have to admit to having read uh, not a bit of Pessoa. It's been on my list and on my shelf physically uh, for years. And I just signed up for this about 30 minutes before uh, it began uh, after reading about it on Marginal Revolution. So thank you, Tyler, and thank you, Agnes, and thank you, everyone else, for asking such great questions. I don't have any uh, that are fully formed at the moment, so I'm happy to be here, and uh, thanks. Okay, great. Jiva. Okay, we'll skip you for now, and we'll go to Erin. Um, yeah, hi. So I um, hadn't heard of Pessoa. I had listened to Agnes' podcast with uh, Eric uh, Weinstein and really loved it and also Tyler's. And so I signed up because of that. Um, and I had quite a personal reaction to Pessoa. So um, I, my, I, I had PTSD three years ago and lost years of memories. And so I went through this process of having to both remember myself by like reading old passages that I'd written and like old messages with people and reconnecting with other people I've known and also just re-experience the world and learn like who I was and how I reacted. And so I don't think I went three paragraphs without like relating to something he said, whether like maybe not exactly, but in the sensory level and his experience that he described where he can like be in a conversation and all of a sudden he pays attention to the people's faces and words are like these ping pong things that are thrown out and you kind of hear them, but don't comprehend them. That happens to me rarely now, but like all the time. It was like, it's like the anxiety increases, the PTSD reaction happens and the OCD gets triggered. And then you're just like, well, you can only focus on one thing. And so the, the words just kind of go away. Mm -hmm. And um, you don't go around talking about that stuff. So this is the first time I've really heard it in words. <laughs> and then like, oh, okay. Someone else has experienced that on some level. Um, so I had a very, um, I think I have a lot of questions. His reading, made me want to read more of him, but also um, I have a lot of questions about how does the self form? How do, um, how do you, like, what is this idea of forming of self just from my personal understanding of having lost and had to rebuild it? And I also think it triggers a lot of, like a lot of his comments on sleeping through life or, um, where is the passage? Uh, something about, it just also makes me think of, I think when sometimes you meet someone and they're in like a totally different reality than you. I think we see this misinformation, right, and all like in politics, but this idea that you can have um, this idea of like relating to other people and how we can all be in such different realities sometimes. Um, and so I just think I have a lot of questions around that, but um, I found it very profound to read him <laughs> just because of that. So I am really glad I did. <laughs> but. That's a really helpful like, point of view on it because it makes me, it, it crystallizes something for me that I hadn't, I couldn't have put this way before you spoke, which is. So like there's some philosophers who 
like Schopenhauer. Okay. He's a philosopher who he was depressed. Okay. And he wrote about how like life sucks and is not worthwhile and is not worth living. He was clearly a depressed person, but he also wrote that as a philosophy. And when you read him as a philosopher, you're like, oh, depression isn't just some kind of mistake. There's actually an intelligible point of view on the world that depression is. It's a mode of thinking and it might be true, right? Um, and that's what you get, I think, from reading Schopenhauer. And I, I had this feeling that there was something like that in Pessoa. And I think you're bringing out that there's like a point of view you can have on the world where you're struggling to form a self. And we can call that, you know, PTSD or can have various names or we can pathologize it in sort of the way that we pathologize depression, right? But it's actually also a mode of thinking or a way of orienting oneself to the world that has its own intelligibility to it. And you can get inside of it and be like, oh, this is actually a way of thinking. It's not the way we usually think, but we don't, what reason do we have for thinking it's not just the right way? Like, um, um, uh, other than the fact that we put a pathological label on it, right? Um, so I hadn't, I hadn't thought of it so that way, but I think that's really a helpful way to frame what's going on. Uh, Roberto. I'll go again. Sure. Oh, did you already go? My, yeah. Screen, yeah. my screen has, oh yeah, of course you did because you're there. Sorry, it, things, when I, do, when I do different views, it shifts on the screen and then I get confused. Uh, Cole is who I meant to call on. Hey everyone. Um, yeah, I don't have a lot of background with uh, Pessoa as well, but um, I think Isabella brought up a lot of the interesting stuff that I think, I mean, related to primacy of fiction and poetry for existential truth. But I think the thing that interests me that he discussed is really the <clears throat> exploration of like the inner life and self to the outer world and kind of the integration of the phenomenological experience. So I know this is like a major kind of topic in neuroscience and philosophy is like the illusion of self and I think we seek this concept of unity in some ways and a coherent self, but actual experience is that of kind of the integration of this multifaceted kind of fractured self. And so the self and experience and consciousness to me in many ways is more emergent and conflictory in terms of emotions and thoughts and experiences rather than some kind of like top-down analytical decision maker. And so is there a way to paradoxically create some sort of unified self out of the acceptance of this, you know, conflictory emergence of self. Um, and so I think with the question of like, is he a philosopher? I'd say all of that has epistemological and ethical implications. So if you think philosophy is kind of wrestling with the art of existence or being or oneself, and I think that that is, uh, that definitely qualifies. Mm. Patricia. Hello. Um, I'm Patricia and I'm based in Switzerland. Um, I'm also an inter-intellect host uh, and by day I'm a data analyst. Um, I'm really interested in the topic of uh, dreams in Pessoa's work, especially in the book of Disquiet. Um, that's why my favorite quote uh, from the book is, I feel as if I'm always on the verge of waking up. Uh, and I'm really interested what kind of interpretations uh, can we assign to being awake and being asleep? Uh, in the book of this quiet. Yeah. Thank Me you. Too. <laughs> okay, we have two people left who've been very patient, um, but they both have their cameras off. So Jenna. Maybe we will go to Cosmin and see if Jenna has turned her camera on. Cosmin, hi. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm a former physicist. Um, I guess uh, one, one part of my question, I have a two-part question, is a bit related to the physics that was happening at the time when he was writing in the early 1900s. There was this fracturing of the notion of external reality um, in special relativity and quantum theory. So I wonder if there's any interesting parallel to his notions of fracturing of internal psychological reality. Was he aware of what was happening in science and physics at the time? Um, and uh, the other, the other part of my question is in the in the reading, uh, there was this theme of uh, dreams of reality being a dream, um, and the other theme was the the sort of fracturing of internal reality. Is there any relationship between those two themes in his writing? 
I'll just say a quick thing, which is like pretty much all the science that Pessoa was interested in, as far as I know, from all of my knowledge of Pessoa comes from this biography I just read. Okay. So, you know, take with the grain of salt, but it's all like fake science, like astrology and like ghosts uh, and various kinds of like kind of quack movements. Um, he got really into a bunch of them. He would sort of get really into it for like a year or a few months and then just be on to the next thing. Uh, so as far as I know, like, uh, you know, he has this very dismissive note about in the very first section about like, oh, science teaches us that there's laws for everything, blah, blah, we can throw all that aside and like not worry about that. And that, that, that's, that's the impression that I got too from, so the answer would be no, like, uh, as far as I can tell. Um, Jenna. Okay, well, maybe we'll, um, so, we all fit on one screen, but we don't quite. Um, I I think I'd like to start just have a discussion. There's so many great questions here, and they sort of fit together. But maybe we can start with um, Abe's question uh, about um, does Pessoa think that thinking is good or bad? And like a bunch of people have said, he's not a nihilist, right? Um, He's, you know, so I said he's a skeptic, he's a quasi skeptic. Um, uh, he, um, you know, is thinking futile and pointless. Um, he seems to want to say no, but then how can it not be? So what does Pessoa think is the function of thought? I guess you can raise your hand. I mean, you can raise your hand by your hands, well, then maybe that's not good because I can't see everyone on one screen. So, but I, if you raise your hand by the other thing, I won't see it either, I guess. I think you can, if you go to reactions, guys, at the bottom of your screen, um, there's, and you click on it, uh, these options um, pop up and one of them is raise hand. And then if you do that, then you will pop up to Agnes's, the top of Agnes's screen. Oh, look, that did work. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, I was worried they'd be on the other screen and then I'd never know that they raised it. Okay, uh, okay, Nigel. I just got this real worry about attributing any view to Pessoa. Um, you know, is he, he sort of provokes us to think for ourselves, but, you know, has he got some clear view behind everything? I doubt it. Um, and then I'm worried that, you know, how are we going to find a key to what, what kind of criterion do we use to say that our interpretation of him is correct? Because he's going to contradict it somewhere. I felt that he's just sort of, from many angles, from many perspectives, exploring what it is to be alive, basically, <laughs> you know, from a slightly unusual perspective, sort of range of perspectives, but, it, but not that there's a clear meaning to be read off. He's not that kind of a thinker. Does he think it's good to explore the meaning of what it is to be alive? Depends what mood he's in. I mean, suppose that he sometimes thinks that's good and he sometimes thinks it's bad, right? Like sort of our question in a way is not like, you know, can we take a set of views and ascribe them to him? I think if he wanted us to do that, he would have done it. The question is like, I think my way of thinking about it, he's, he kind of ha he kind of half baked something and we got to bake it the other half of the way. Uh, and so, you know, how do we complete his thought that is, do we complete it in the direct? And, and it might just be, he says a bunch of things and there is no one way to complete it. That's an option. Um, um, but I mean, in a way the challenge is to kind of get to any non-nihilist -nihil view, right? Let's see, Erin uh, uh, has her hand up. Oh yeah, I was just, I mean, in some sense, I feel like he wishes he, um, he wishes that, for himself that he wanted more to like live more to be like present and but he's like chosen dreaming as like the more pleasurable way to live um but i do think there's this like inherent conflict in yeah he's like inherently conflicted about what like what way one should live um like i get the sense that he um and I just get the sense that he, there is this, this um, he's chosen to dream and to think, but he also sees like the futility in that. Yeah, Good. I mean, 
good. There's something, especially from reading his biography, one gets the sense of him actually as someone who was in some way deeply compelled to live as he did. Like he didn't have a choice about it. He almost wanted to be something other than what he was. He keeps on baking plans to go to London. That's what happens in his book. He's like, I'm going to go to London. He wanted to be an English poet more than anything. That is, he did write poetry in English, but he wanted to be known as an English language poet. And his English language poetry is good, but all of it is kind of like a little bit awkward and sounds like somebody who's not writing in their native language. Uh, brilliant in some ways, but still has this feel, right? So he, he wanted to be someone other than who he was. And yet he, there's a sense of compulsion that, that drives his life, which almost makes me feel like actually in some level, he's very consistent. Um, Anna. Thank you so much. It's a little bit like the Chekhovian characters who always want to go to Moscow and then somehow never do. They just sit around around the samovar. Um, I, I, I would like to kind of uh, go back to Nigel's question and, and add, add mine to that. I, because maybe the maybe the, um, the the kind of beautiful underlying uh, question when it comes to Peshawar is not um, what Han um, you know outlined that would you know put him in uh, at par with the uh, with the French advocates of the authorless writing um, and the Barthesian trends. Um, it's more that you know writing and thinking is not just the act of doing so. Um, but also to edit yourself and to choose, right? Um, and I, I get really um, annoyed by speeches that where I feel like the, the 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 speaker didn't edit him or herself, and now I have to do it, even though they get paid for it. Um, and and this is this makes it very timely. It it makes it uh, you know it it moves it out of the write at night, edit in the morning framework, and puts it you know to where Twitter or the, the blogosphere is um, where people just kind of vomit out some text and good luck, son, you know, put it together at home. And you're like, ah, but you will contradict me whatever I choose, you should. Um, so yeah, I just find it really, uh, really funny. And, and I don't know what you guys think about that. Should we, should, should we all have an internal editor as well? Mm. Yeah, good. Pessoa more than anyone really, like in a very deep sense for light and external editors. <laughs> Um, ben. Yeah, but this is different. This is different from the you know Socrates or Jesus didn't write down their own stuff. Like this is a Jesus who did write down his stuff, and then was like, "You edit, right?" Right, 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 right. Good. Yeah, that's really interesting to think of the difference between somebody who walks around and then other people can record what they choose versus recording it but in a non, in a not very selective way. Um. Yeah, or uh, just to break in, if I may, uh, it's kind of like Plato, who instead of writing a speech about rhetoric in the Phaedrus, he writes a series of speeches about what it would be like to write a speech about rhetoric, <laughs> right? Frustrating everybody who wanted a positive answer to the question. Yeah, and also I'm thinking about the folk singer, the folk singers of the early 20th century, right? Like you were just like standing around in the village singing yep. and then Bartok and Kodai came with their recorders. And then the next time you sang it a little bit differently and they were like, but wait a minute, the first time you sang it in like- uh, you know, Are you an incompetent folk singer or something? Yeah. <laughs> they were doing what they were supposed to do. Ben. Yeah, um, so- uh, yeah, I, I asked in the chat earlier, like, is, is, this a, is this a conceit? Like, how aware is, how, how much is he living this? And how much is this a thing that he's doing on purpose? Because, so all the while he's writing as a single identity, as a single pseudonym, he has to maintain that identity while he's being that person. And then he's shifting while he's writing is so it's not he's not completely fractured he's in a, in a given moment he's having to hold on to being a certain thing so and and so if 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 you're completely married to the idea that you're completely fractured like that that kind of text would be like even from sentence to sentence is going to be broken up even within sentences but there's there's something that's holding together between and so there's the the kind of the the sort of meta reasoning here is that he's he's actually doing this to show that this is what he's trying to that, that we should be many personas so he writes in all these personas in order to make this statement 
about being a fractured, about being fractured selves. But in, in order to do that, he has to embody it and has to kind of push it. So, so how much is he actually living this? And how much is it experienced? And how much is this a point that he's trying to make by doing it? Paul. Yeah, there's a, a point where uh, Pessoa describes a particular night where he's standing up at his desk and he suddenly turns into the three main poets that he ends up uh, publishing, Richard Ricardo Reese, Campos and Carrera, I think his name is. And he spends about 30 hours writing all these poems. Mm -hmm. And so he describes this as some kind of epiphany or mystical experience where these heteronyms kind of come out of him and he creates them. And of course he had already created many other selves before that or heteronyms. But it turns out that the story itself is a fiction. So it's a fiction within a fiction within a fiction. And so to answer your question, I think he's quite deliberate about this. In many ways, he's, he's being playful. And I think I saw recently that somebody um, compared this to Shakespeare without plays. So he would create characters that had no plays, um, but he loved the characters. And as Agnes mentioned, that he would have them argue and criticize each other. That was part of his playfulness. Uh, all three of the major poets would say Pessoa was the most inferior of the poets. So he's basically poking at himself, you know? And so I don't think it's so much about him trying to reconcile the fragment himself. I think he actually enjoyed it. And he was trying to create something different. And in many ways, he's sui generis in Western literature. There are some little bits of him and other people, but um, I think that's really what's going on. I think he actually tried to create this world of fictional characters and see how much he could make them work. You know, they'd review each other's poems and sometimes he'd try to publish that. So it's a bit of a fraud, right? If you write a, create a, another poet and then you write a review of his poems and say, look at these great poems and buy his books, you know, you know, he's great. And another poet you create says, ah, he's not that great. I think this other guy is better. So he did stuff like that. It was very playful, very, you know, I think he was doing it on purpose. I think he enjoyed it. One thing he would do is like, suppose he was planning to go for a walk with a friend. He'd sometimes send them a note saying, today you're going for a walk with Alvaro de Campos. Um, <laughs> And in fact, his like one romantic relationship basically broke up more than once over the fact that his beloved Ophelia Cuervas could not stand Alvaro de Campos and he'd be Alvaro and be like, just don't, can you just get him out away from us? You know, like she just did not want to be in a relationship with this guy. She still loved him and she still would have stayed with him, but it was really Alvaro was the thing that stood between them. I mean, so these, these, these personae really like showed up in his life in a very direct way. Uh, Isabella. Yeah, so a, a couple of points now, there's a, maybe I'll just stick to my original one, which was, uh, but there's a lot that was just said by Paul that's really relevant here. So playfulness, and, and, and so I, there's another hypothesis I have is, which is that he was a bad writer in terms of projects. There are people who do really well at like blog posts or, or Twitter threads, but they can't actually get across a coherent novel, for example, because they are such good writers and, and they're, they're such good critics, they understand what that requires. And he just may not have had basically the ability to write well a larger project. And so these personas may have been these playful attempts to do something out there without doing the thing that he actually, and maybe the act of translation was really as close as he could get to what he really wanted to do, which is to create, you know, these, these stories, longer term story that I have no idea because whatever, but it just, I, I feel like there might be something there and part of that kind of viciousness at himself, but also others feels like a frustration with the act that he's trying to do and is not able to somehow, you know, create. And so I, I put in the chat that we, we talked about the birth and not uh, birthing yourself, but the other, he has a passage around 
death and his own death, right? And putting, taking the hand off the noose of his own self and he himself doing that. So there's this suicidal, but also hero kind of saving of himself. And I think that there is something about his unwriting or his, his the frustration that he has with the act of writing that might be there underlying there. Yeah, he actually admitted that he couldn't do it. He just did, made fragments and threw them in the trunk. And uh, but he wasn't told- happy with that. Like he was, he was, he was distraught over this his whole life, and he sort of blamed himself for like not having a will. There's a phrase in here about the dead will that his will is dead, um, and. Um, like there was a part of his life when he wanted to become like strong and muscular. He was in, I mean, early twenties or something. And so he, he bought all these books about like weightlifting and then he created a header on him that was like this, this bodybuilder, big, strong guy, right? <laughs> Instead of actually lifting the weights, he just created the fictional character who has lifted the weights. Right. And that to me is like, he, 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 there was this, you know, the will, there was like this problem for him about a will. He was like, I almost don't even have a will. Um, And that was a, but I think it's a very perceptive point, Isabella, that like somehow there's a certain unit or size of text that he seems to be able to produce. And he's sort of almost like trying to find his way around that um, and trying to wrangle with himself uh, in a weird way. Uh, Rick. I wonder if um, Pessoa was that kind of remarkable and different from the rest of us. And I don't mean to underplay what he did, but it strikes me that what was really important about what he did was the fact that he just wrote this down. You know, like in many ways, he doesn't strike me as as different to say actors. You know, you think of like uh, the British filmmaker, Mike Lee, you know, he goes through a, a really long, intense rehearsal process with all of uh, the actors before they actually film, you know, put the film into production and they spend maybe six weeks working through their characters and he encourages them to design backstories for their characters and if you listen to any of the actors that have had to inhabit these roles they feel like they're taking on this other kind of persona and they make up all kind of stories about where they went to school and problems they had and what their favorite food is and favorite tv show and and take that all to kind of add into who the character is that they're going to be somehow uh, embodying or playing for a period of time and so I just think about daydreaming when I when I daydream about where I'd like to go that I can't actually get to because I, I can't be there and do my job or be with my family or whatever the case might be. Um, I, I don't think that my kind of uh, seemingly rich daydreaming life is probably much different from anybody else's or perhaps Pessoa's, but, but I don't write that down very much. And I feel like he, he did. And that's one of the remarkable things about his body of work. Yeah, good. And that's a that's a good point. There was something earlier that somebody said. Um, and maybe, yeah, maybe this is sort of like the thing that Aaron was talking about. It connects up for me, where there's a bu- there's a bunch of stuff that we experience or think, but we don't glorify it with the idea of writing about it. We don't think it deserves sustained attention. And he, it's like he's paying attention to a bunch of stuff. And that's why he, in some way he's super weird, but we also really, he resonates with so many people. I think just because he, he's treating a bunch of thoughts as deserving of attention and articulation where all of us have had those thoughts, but have not deemed them worthy of that somehow. Michael. Uh, just, uh, I just wanted to come back to this question of individuation in relation to the writing, because I, I think you could, you could understand it as the process of individuation itself. You know, he's, he's individuating himself through the writing, and he's also individuating others through the writing. So from, from what point of view can it be completed if it's a process that always has to be incomplete, there's a kind of refusal somehow of the necessary closure perhaps that you need to make a work because the writing is bearing this burden of individuation. 
which means that the only closure uh, is death. So that the, the writing is in a sense at the same time in process and posthumous. And indeed, you know, in the Book of Disquiet, it was many years after his death before it was, uh, it was published. But, you know, maybe that's not an accident, you know, that it was part of the non the non-closure, the postponement of closure, that it had to be postponed until that sort of, that distant, uh, that distant point, which means there can be no position, for example, from which one could do a final edit, because that would imply a sort of completed individual that was doing it, you know, and, and then that individual would have to be put into process, in which case the editing would become a kind of endless process as well. So, um, you know, I, I just see it in that way, maybe. That's a great point. There's this, you know, one of the passages that I gave you guys was this one where he contrasts death with sleep. And he's like, they're really not the same because the entire point of sleep is that you wake up and death is not like that, right? Uh, and uh, and the, he says, death is like somebody left something behind, like somebody left a suit of clothes behind, you know? And so there's this thought of like, what is Pessoa going to leave behind? And like, there's just no fact of the matter about that until he dies. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, and he had a really, from how I interpret him from the biography, an interesting attitude towards his own death in the sense that he basically drank himself to death at the age of like, I don't know, 45 or so. And he had warnings, you know, he had this kind of, a, I can't remember what it's called, tremor shaking, you know, from alcoholism. And uh, he didn't appear to ever be drunk to anyone. He drank all the time and like no one ever saw him drunk, but he, but but he, he was clearly going into liver failure and he had all these signs of people like, you're gonna die. And he didn't, it's not that he wanted to die, but he's kind of like, ah, you know, so, so that like he didn't seek his own death, but he didn't quite avoid it either. Um, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, maybe there's a kind of necessity to the thought that he could only, that, that the, the only kind of completeness his life could achieve would be something like cessation. That's, that's super interesting. Anna. Thank you so much. I would like to go back to the question of loneliness here because maybe it, it holds the key to understanding this kind of fragmentation in, you know, in more ways than, than at least I thought. So how most healthy people or people with you know, healthy um, social relationships express the, the complexities that, you know, or, or the, the complexity of the many, the many people that inhabit them is often through other people. Right, so not just the kind of sedimentary layers of the different people that we've been throughout our lives, right? Like our parents know us from early childhood, our the, fr the friends from our childhood know us from th those phases of childhood. And then later on, we kind of accumulate these different observers and witnesses of our lives. And, and so I can imagine that, you know, in, for many people, for instance, a family conflict, especially if it's between a, their current family and the old family from where they're from, often feels so unresolvable is because they are literally conflicts between their different parts, right? But if you don't have social relationships and then, you know, maybe at first glance, you would think that a lonelier person is more aligned, but what might actually happen is that you can't outsource these different aspects of yourselves. And if you're a highly creative and alcoholic person, this might actually like manifest as these, almost multiple personality disorder that this wonderful poet um, suffered from. And I, I, I often joke that, you know, we love sitcoms like Friends because, you know, we, we, we observe our own, the, our own, the, our, um, our, the parts of our own selves fragmented it into different characters, right? We are all Joey and Monica. We, a, a normal person is all six in one. So what you observe is basically a little conflicts and, and fun between your different selves. Um, but most people are contented with, you know, um, actually enjoying that in their real lives and then uh, maybe watching a sitcom. So it would be quite interesting to, to, to I don't know, if, if I were to, uh, if, I, if I were in grad school, I would probably write a paper, um, the Hegelian tragedy of, uh, internal Hegelian tragedy in Peshoa, <laughs> where his conflict is split into conflicts with himself. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's super interesting. 
Nigel. Um, just following on from what Anna was saying, um, you know, the psychologist Irving Goffman talks about the self as being socially constructed through what he calls dramaturgical interactions. You know, you, he takes seriously the idea that all the world's a stage. Um, and we have these different roles that we play out um, in different to different people in different social situations. And he was fascinated by the kind of juggling that we have to do when we meet people. We have two different masks we're juggling between when we meet people from two different situations. And obviously, um, Pessoa is quite a lonely character. He's not interacting in that way most of the time. But I've got a, I'm, I'm not sure if you quoted this passage. I've got, I think I've got a different edition of the Book of Disquiet, but there's a, a, a passage which has got two numbers on it. It looks 62 and 34 here, where he says, I created various personalities within myself. I create them constantly. Every dream, as soon as it, as soon as it is dreamed, is immediately embodied by another person who dreams it instead of me. Which, which I took to mean, you know, he, he creates these personalities and then externalizes them and they almost have a life of their own. He, he, you know, with that idea that you had of those imaginary friends, as it were. And then he goes on, in order to create, I destroyed myself. I've externalized so much of my inner life that even inside I now exist only externally. Um, you know, so he's playing this game and he actually uses the kind of Humean picture of a stage then. I am the living stage across which various actors pass, acting out different plays. So he is just the stage, which is, you know, what Hume famously said when he tried to find the self by introspection, David Hume, trying to find this self that religious thinkers talk about, you know, you, if you introspect, surely you can find your soul. Hume empirically looks inside and says, no, there's nothing, just like fleeting impressions. And that's more or less the image that we've got of Pessoa introspecting he can't find himself because he's pushed it all out into these imaginary friends who've now got their own dreams going on beyond him and there's nothing left but he doesn't have the social creation of a self that the that Irving Goffman talks about it's a motivated stage um, my, my, my notion here is that he's living out something in himself that most people you know, I, I use the word outsource, which is a terrible word to use, but, you know, so for instance, when, when you meet like a nice continental philosopher and they want to explain Hamlet to an English person, they will be like, oh, there is this internal, you know, war between the medieval morality and the Renaissance frivolity, and that's the father and the uncle. And that's, but that's what we do in real life. When I have an internal conflict, I will surely like tape it on other people and be like, but this friend said, when that person said, and you, you immediately create an actual ensemble in your life, right? Because you want to have people on the side of your different, if you have an internal conflict, you want to have people on both sides and kind of played out between them. But instead this guy said, no, <laughs> I will do this myself. And to me, that's fascinating. Well. Yeah, I just uh, want to go back a little bit to what Michael said. Um, but um, uh, this guy, uh, Simondon, is a pretty interesting philosopher. And he had a, a great effect on Gilles Deleuze, a French philosopher. And Deleuze is sort of an anti-Platonist in the sense that he ends up concluding that it's multiplicity that we should be looking for, not unity. So, you know, the Western viewpoint is the one and the many, what is it? And everyone looks for the one, either God or even a secular version of grand unified theory or something like that. But Deleuze and Pessoa fall into this very unusual camp, and maybe Heraclitus of no, there's no unity. There's just multiplicity. Um, now you don't have to take that as true, but the wonderful thing about Pessoa is you can find both. Um, but if he had lived longer, he would have doubled his he heteronyms because that's what he liked. And he was quite frank about it, that it was all playfulness. It was all just fun. Um, I think he thought himself as a person was kind of boring. That's pretty clear from all of his letters and things. 
but of course he wasn't because he had all this incredible fiction within him. So I think, like I said in the beginning, you can find almost everything in Pessoa. And I think all the you know, comments that are being made reflect what, what's there. And that's what makes him really unusual, I think, because you're not gonna find one answer no matter how, how much you look, I just don't think you're gonna find it. So have fun. I agree with you, Paul, but I think that that last claim undermines the idea that it's somehow all playfulness. To me, that's mm. too dismissive. Like, I think that he is in some way taken over by these people and possessed by them. And he relies on them to live. And like, sometimes it's half serious and then sometimes it's more serious than he wants it to be. Like there's yeah. a level of control that he doesn't always seem to have. And I guess the other thing that I would say just about the book of disquiet is that <clears throat> there is this sense of striving for unity right throughout the text. And I wanted to get back to Abe's question about, you know, what is the optimism here or something like that. And it seems to me like there is like, yes, there is all this, um, you know, um, um, bifurcation, whatever, in furcation, prifurcation to multiple subs, I mean, at least two in the Book of Disquiet, but there is also this uh, a, attempt to, the, to be universal by swallowing everything, like by including every self, right? So there is this attempt at universality. Um, now, how do we theorize that attempt itself? I think that Pessoa does have some resources for that. So the, the passage that I would point to is the one where he says, he is inclined to be a little bit dismissive about what he himself is doing, but there's like one passage where he says that it's like when you read a text out loud. So he is to reality as the person reading a text out loud is to the text, right? So it's like he's reading life out loud. Um, uh, that's, I think, maybe in the very first uh, of the passages that I, I gave you, right? So, so that's somehow thinking, uh, um, um, or at least it's writing, right? Uh, 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 he says, so this is, yeah, this is in the first passage. Um, he says, you know, we recognize our sensations as the only reality for ha we, ha we have for certain. This is the decadent point of view that he has. And if we express anything, it's merely like when a reader reads out loud to fully objectify the subjective pleasure of reading. So he has this thought that somehow writing, thinking and writing is like a way of completing the sense experience, um, a way of living it more fully. Um, uh, that to me is somewhat compelling in terms of, especially there was somebody earlier who was pointing out, um, uh, maybe it was Rick. Um, yeah, it was Rick who was saying like, we've all lived this. It's like, yeah, we've all lived this, but we haven't lived it fully in the way that he has because he wrote it down. So he, by focusing his attention on certain things in a way made them more real on certain aspects of life, I think. Um, so, and that's, I think not nihilistic. Um, that is, I think that there's a sense there of like, there's a part of your life that you may not be living. It's happening, but you're not living it. And he wants to live that aspect of his life and he does it in some way by writing it. So, so that would be my answer to at least one, it's one take on what is non-nihilistic about both thought and writing. I'm interested to hear more from you guys about, um, I, I, I know everyone wants to talk about multiple selves, that's cool too, but, um, but about, um, you know, just, uh, sense experience and the way that Pessoa is suggesting in a way that we are all artists of our own sense experience. Um, and that life, like right now, right? We're having a bunch of sense experiences with this weird screen in front of us. And, uh, you know, there's like, we're all in rooms where there's like smells and things, right? And, and we have to, we have to feel, we have to decide what to pay attention to. And do you think that there's some kind of possible like radical answer to that? Like that, like maybe we're just, paying attention to the wrong things. And somebody brought up the question of attention versus awareness. Like maybe there's a mode of attention which is unfocused or which is where we're less trying to control it, is controlling it bad. I'm just interested to hear more thoughts about that, about the sort of sensory side of Pessoa.
I'll start just a little bit about, you know, he has a, a quote from one of his poems, I think, um, to eat a free fruit is to know its meaning. And um, so he has a lot of little things like that, particularly in some of the poems. And he's sort of repetition on that, it's sort of a trope that he, he often uses to make the point that, um, you know, things don't have meaning until you sort of taste them. Um, I, that's probably not a very good way to put it, but he, his whole philosophy that he, or a movement he tried to start in Portugal, was, I think they called it sensationist or something like that. Um, it was based on this idea of, of getting closer to the senses. And so, yeah, he does have a lot of stuff like that. I think it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, and you'll find a lot of that in his poetry. Yeah. I guess I, I was sort of confused about what Basoa's attitude towards actually having sense experiences was. Um, sort of especially, this comes up in the last section, uh, 123 on where so it's giving sort of his argument against the value of traveling, um, which you might think the value of traveling is that you can then have all these new experiences. Um, and so if you value sense experience and things like this, then you really ought to value traveling a lot. Um, but Pessoa suggests that sort of insofar as we sort of are, so much of what we experience is, is produced by ourselves. Um, there's not really any point in actually going out and having experiences um, that if we're capable of an experience, then we can produce it without actually having it. Um, so then there's sort of this weird uh, ambivalence there where experience is valued, but because it's valued as experience rather than as actual happening, there's sort of no point in actually having the experience in the world. Um, and there's sort of this related point in this passage I was sort of confused about where there's sort of an ambivalence there about sort of writing and expressing experience as well, where so it suggests sort of all we can actually say about our experiences or what's universal about them. Um, and that strips sort of actual significant experience part out of it. Um, but then sort of the suggestion of, but I found that sort of hard to reconcile with the idea that the actual experience is just sort of what we're producing on our own rather than what we actually um, what we actually need to go out there and have an experience to get. Um, if the idea also is that sort of if you're not at the actual cathedral, then you can't have any of the actual experience of being at the cathedral. But at the same time, there's no point in going to the cathedral since we're making up the experience of the cathedral on our own. So sort of that whole package of ideas so it has about those issues was sort of very confusing to me in a way. That's great. So um, I think I think you've raised like two really good problems at least. So like one is just Pessoa seems to say that all he is is somebody who focuses on his sensations. And then he also seems to equate everything that's relevant about sensation to the imagination component of it. Like that there's a, you know, so if you think about like a sense experience, like we're all having sense experiences right now, right? But you could think of that as, you know, almost like, well, there's a screen, right? And we're seeing things as projected onto the screen and it may happen that reality matches the screen or not, right? But our sense experience is just whatever is on the screen. Uh, I mean, here we have a literal screen, right? But even when I turn to the rest of my office, like, well, there's in a way just another screen, uh, a screen inside of my mind, right? And, you know, there's many passages where Pessoa seems to say like, yeah, if you can just create those for yourself, that's way more practical. He says, those are the real practical people because we can like, we can have whatever experiences we want. And it almost starts to be reminiscent of, um, you know, this philosopher named Nozick has this idea of the experience machine. Right, where you could, it's like the matrix. Like you plug yourself into something and then it simulates a bunch of experiences and maybe they're like a bunch of happy and positive experiences. And Nozick is like, why not? Why not plug yourself in? Would everyone plug themselves in? You know, and Nozick thinks, no, people wouldn't. Uh, I've talked to people, some people would. <laughs> um, but in any case, Pessoa seems to think sort of life sort of is an experience machine. And we have these, um, 
you know, we have these sensations um, that are like, maybe they're caused by the external world, but the important part is the part that faces us, which is internal. And so look, why does he focus so much on the idea of like, do I attend to the mouth or the sound? In a way, whatever I attend to is the only thing that's happening, right? Is the only thing that's showing up on the me side of the screen. Um, so that's like one question that Josh is raising. And then the other one is, I think you're absolutely right to pick up on this, the universal versus the particular. It shows up in the final section and then also earlier where there's some passage that I, 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 I underlined it. Now I can't remember what he's like. There are only two possibilities. Either something is true, like for all human beings, or it's true for one, or something. <laughs> like he has this, like, oh yeah, um, what has happened to us has happened to everyone, or to only us, or only to us. Okay, so it's like there are two possibilities, right? And I mean, that's that's crazy and false. That like you know, sometimes there might be things that happen only to some subset of people, right? Um, but but this kind of universalism where only the things that happen to everyone in some sense are communicable also pulls against sensation in a weird way, right? Because sensation is sort of particular and maybe incommunicable. I can't tell you what red looks like to me. And so, so the, the, the idea that you have to jump from the ineffably particular all the way to the universal um, uh, is also just a sort of puzzling thing to combine with the, <clears throat> the idea that he's a kind of poet of sensation and stuff. Anyway, good, so that's just what I wanted to talk about. So now there's a bunch of hands. Um, okay, I'm just gonna take you in the order that you're on. Actually, I'm gonna take you in the order of people who haven't spoken again. So Eric. Yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about the very early kind of thing where it's talking about us being scholars, hunching over the books of sensation and the comparison between the kind of scientific fatality and the divine fatality and absurdity, that kind of kind of puts into frame the this, this screen that you were talking about. The other thing that I thought was really striking and it kind of reminded me of the Oscars a little bit of like the, the idea of there's a quote, I think on 91, about every point of view is an inverted pyramid whose base is indeterminate. Yeah. And I just like, you know, I grew up in Nebraska and it's a lot of flat land and a lot of people don't like that. But you get out to see the horizon or you climb a tree that's like standing in the middle of a bunch of cornfields and it's just more and more and more horizon. It's kind of strange to think about in terms of how does that relate to my subjectivity, you know, and, and all the millions of microscopic things that are happening in that field as well, like that I can't sense. And like the limits of, not only the limits of like, I see what I see and you see what you see, for example, or like these chiral objects that kind of like shift as we look at them in different ways. But like, I don't know, the sensation part, it really kind of like grounded it for me a little bit in a nice way. I don't think that he's saying that there is no self. And I don't think that he's saying that there's an absolute self or whatever, but this idea of like kind of waving between hither and thither or something. Yeah, I mean, it's a good point. Like I too, sometimes I feel lost in Pessoa and the, I, the, the phrases that mention sensation are like a grounding to me where I'm like, okay, now I know what we're talking about. We're talking about things like red. I know what red is, you know? But I think then, then I am very much pulled in Josh's direction, which is to be like, but wait a minute, he's talking about the imagined red, you know? So I need to talk about red. <clears throat> so, so I think you're right that he does this grounding and then he pulls the ground out from under you um, by telling you that like by sensation, what I sort of mean is imagined sensation. Chloe. I, um, I find some of the sensory phrases in Pessoa not grounding. <laughs> like there's a point when there is a wind that smells green, <laughs> a lack of sound that smells like pleasure a sense of smell that shifts behind the eyes. And at one point he speaks about his skin and then the skin of the pillow. And it brings for me to mind actually the dissolving margins in Elena Ferrand, that kind of thing of an experience of some kind of synesthesia is almost like a negative epiphany. 
instead of your sense perception revealing some kind of meaning or value in the usual way, the meaning or value is just obscured. <laughs> and it's not grounding, I guess. That's a great connection with the dissolving margins. I agree with you. Um, and I, I, that thing about the pillow, that the skin of the pillow touched my skin, where it is as though the, it's like, it's the equivalent of touching another person almost is the idea. Like this is no different from touching another person, touching a, like everything has an outer surface and it's just one outer surface coming into contact with another outer surface. Um, uh, and the, 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 the way in which um, in some way though, I think that that is like extreme focus on your sense experience is kind of dissolving and disorienting. I remember a story someone told me once of this what didn't happen to me, but it's someone told me she she remembers learning how to read and uh, seeing like the Coca Cola signs, and then you know then there was a time after she knew how to read where she could like it, you know, and then she would tr she would she remembers trying to see them the way that she used to see it before she could read, trying to see the letters as just like you know um, shapes, and how difficult that is, right? And it, but it's like Pessoa has that art of decomposing things from the way in which we would we have organized them, right? So we have these organizing frameworks where it's like, well, there's me and there's a pillow and we are two very different things. Uh, and it, there's a kind of, um, yeah, a kind of dis dissolution that can happen. It can actually happen if you repeat a word too many times. It happens, right? Like if you repeat a word over and over and over again, it start it starts like falling apart as a unit of meaning. It starts to become a weird sort of sound. Um, so I think I think it's a great point that somehow that's it, th that's such a good corrective in a way because like the the direction that Josh was leading me in was like, oh yeah, it's all the imagination, it's all internal. I think that's right, but there's there's a way of 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 making that move where it's like. Well, what it is, is a kind of um, schematized, almost cartoonish version of one sense experience, which is sort of what you produce with the imagination, right? Like if I think of some cathedral that I went to in the past, like what I'll have in my head is some very vague and in a way very highly conceptualized version of the intricate sense experience that I had at the time, right? And it's like, as much as Pessoa moves inward to the imagination, he also is doing this thing of making the sense experience decompose in such a way that the imagined, uh, the imagination version of it is not the normal version. It's not the cathedral. It's like something that has been uh, broken and messed up as a sense experience. It's that thing that's somehow on the inside. Uh, Brian. Yeah, I, I love what you're saying. And I'm, it, it is really interesting, just all these kind of tensions where he sets up a binary and then rejects both options. So like, um, yeah, the universal is completely impersonal, right? But then the really particular is actually ineffable or incommunicable to another person. Um, he kind of, I think he does this a little bit with, um, doesn't he talk about the laws of science? And so there's almost like this objectivity, subjectivity, dialectic and he kind of ends up rejecting that as well um and i don't know i, I guess i was thinking and there's also the self other boundary and if you think about like proprioception you try to i've done this before like in meditation where you try to actually feel where the sensation of your clothes starts and you know your body ends and you can't actually do it in any detail like the harder you look at it the more fuzzy it gets somehow and so there's like a kind of, it's almost like he's pushing these binaries. And it, I mean, the subjective objective one is another kind of fascinating one, just because, you know, people want to go to facts and this is the, you know, the fact about the universe or they, or they reject that and end up in saying, no, it's all imagined or it's all subjective. And yet like there is this kind of like in reality, it's interpersonal and there's like this constant interplay and the same goes for sensations, right? Like you, you have a sensation which is like a perception that feels like it's coming in. And yet, you know, in activism or these other things tell us that, no, you also inspect the world. You, you alter the world by interacting with it. And so there's kind of like this back and forth um, interplay. So I really liked um, this idea that about the tension between projecting um, 
uh, your perceptions versus receiving them. And, um, but the other interesting thing about this is that he doesn't actually seem to enjoy sensation. Like um, I'm just looking at this section where he says, my sensations in all their horrible acuity and a profound awareness of feeling, a sharp mind that only destroys me um, and an unusual capacity for dreaming to keep me entertained. There's another section where I think he talks about how horrible the sun is or something like that, or it's like the, the sunlight burns his eyes. And so he is very interested in these sensations and yet he almost seems to take like, he almost seems to have an aversion towards them. And then I guess that's where the projected imagination world or dreaming comes in. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I, I kind of like the way that he sets up binaries and then ends up rejecting both of them. It's not like there's a synthesis. It's like the opposite of that. It's like, you know, <laughs> thesis, antithesis, and then just, he just leaves it in that um, <laughs> negative capability or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I think one of the ways he does that is just by sometimes connecting some a word or a concept with a phrase that would normally be thought to be its opposite. So he'll gloss sensation as dreaming, right? And he's like, I'm dreaming. And he says things like, my dreams are so light and soft that like someone can talk to me while I'm dreaming, you know, and I can keep dreaming. Um, he had that shows up somewhere in the, in the text I, I signed to you. Um, uh, and so it's like, normally we would think of sensation as being the opposite of dreaming. Right? And this is the sort of Josh's puzzle. Um, uh, but I, I do think that leaves us in a position where there's sort of something we have to decode or untangle in Pessoa. Like, it's like, it, it's not a finished, to me anyway, it's not a finished thought. Uh, Eloy. Yeah, uh, I just want to push back a little bit on the, on the, on what I think Josh and, and you are talking about in trying to be practical. Um, and I just want to remember just bring about the thing about the accountant like he's being an accountant in terms of trying to 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 um try to mix or synthesize what is particularly universal like accountants do accountants they just uh they pretty much say you know what all like all balance sheets are different but they always follow the same logic pro logical process right so you could argue that he's saying okay the most practical way of having an experience is just having an experience like in terms of the individual um the same way like the same the most practical way for a company to pretty much be able to keep an inventory will be by just being able to just record its 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 all its assets liabilities and equity in the same way like all the everyone everyone else everyone else does um so that way you can actually achieve universality by just focusing on the particular. So I, I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll have to disagree with, uh, I think it was Brian, Brian? I think it was what you were saying in terms of like the, the synthesis and the antithesis. Like, I think it was trying to synthesize that, but in terms of a practical and perhaps not in a very, perhaps I'm just seeing too much into that line about the, about how he wants to make, create an, an accounting of the experiences that he feels. But I do have to agree to, to the fact that he just, uh, he doesn't seem so, despite the fact that he wants to create that accounting, he doesn't seem too interested in trying to engage with, with things um, because he does talk about fatigue and how that is just not, how he just, he, 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 like there's a part that he even quotes about, he quotes about he's just tired of being loved. I think it was in Shati Brown, he says about that. So I would say that he's just being like a, I won't say I was like a bad accountant, but I see like he just wants to be, he wants to just record the, what are the, the impressions that life, in like, the impressions that life are, are that are interesting to him. Um, and perhaps I'm wrong in that sense, but it just seems to be just doing that sort of, of, of registering. But, um, but yeah, I will leave it, I'll leave it at that, at, at that, yes. I feel like this connects up actually to the passage that you mentioned at the very beginning, right, about the, um, uh, that civilization is born out of misunderstanding. Um, um, because like, it's like that's the, there's a problem with the synthesis, right? <laughs> and the problem partly involves that the input of other people is required. Like this is Pessoa, you know, 
I envy all other people because I'm not them, like this kind of um, hunger to become everybody else. That's part of the synthesis. You're synthesizing in other people too. And yet if you don't understand them, uh, and if there's always this kind of gap in the translation of one person's language or perception to another, then, then there isn't a kind of straightforward path here of like how one has thoughts, right? Um, because there are all these misunderstandings that are blocking the way anyway to the synthesis. So at least that much complexity we have to add into the story. Uh, okay, um, who was next? Uh, Isabella. Yeah, so, so many great thoughts here. And I wanted, I've been sort of mulling over memory and the, the way that memory works, right? Because you need to have had your experiences or thoughts and then in the act of writing, there is a sense of um, calling on different sources of memory and really going back to Aaron's point around, there are some pretty um, compelling pieces of evidence that there is at least some trauma or super, suffering here in this man and not not only the obvious that everybody has brought up but it's also the way that he processes sensations so that when he talks that passage that you already brought up when he talks a lot about um you know i can focus on you know the eyes or the mouth or the whatever it is when we are traumatized or super sad or whatever it is our perception goes like this right and we pull in um pieces of stimuli that A, we can cope with at that moment, and B, that also are in tune with our sort of um, predictive brain kind of pulling in what's relevant at that time. And you can't take in all relevant information. And, and by hearing you say that he was a real social guy who went out and had lots and lots of conversations, and yet this is what he pulls in and and writes about, I find it really fascinating that it, it feels very dissociative at, at times. There isn't, there isn't, well, you guys have talked, Brian talked also about this tension where there isn't, the sense making isn't completed. It's just that the tension is there, but the sense making isn't completed. And so one of the other things I was thinking about going, it's no wonder that it, both his poetry and even in his prose, it's so poetic, his poetry, that he chooses that way of making sense of his multiple selves. Because I think for me anyway, poetry is perhaps the best medium through which you both get the universals. There are these principles of being human and, and connecting with others through poetry happens, but also super individual so that you can also express the, the most personal, right? And there's something about the poetic form that he's chosen, the medium that seems to be the perfect one for him to kind of go through his suffering and make, try to make sense of it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right about the that it's like a point of view of trauma somehow. You know, having read the biography of his life, there isn't some obvious thing that one could, he had a young, he had his father died when he was young, six or seven uh, of tu uh, tuberculosis. Uh, a bunch of family members then died of tuberculosis. Uh, and he had, his, you know, younger, several younger siblings who died. Um, uh, and he moved to Durban, South Africa at the age of, I think, seven. Do we really need more than his father dying at it, like a pretty formative age and several si siblings to imagine there's some real suffering and the fact that people were yeah, like- One can imagine it, it's just not obvious. Like there's nothing that I read in the biography that suggests that his later, anything specifically connects to those things. It, it may be, um, but that, so those are the things I can think of that could, right, have been uh, traumatic. Um, but it almost, um, I guess my sense is like um, that there's something, um, there, it might be that there is, I don't know, I, I guess this is the thing I was saying to Aaron, that um, there's a frame of mind that trauma puts you in that maybe trauma also put Pessoa in that frame of mind, but a kind of hyper-focus, as you say, uh, and a kind of de, um, uh, deconstruction of sense experience that, that he didn't only, um, what, it wasn't only that he was thrown into it, it was that he gravitated into it. You know what I mean? It wasn't the, just that he was forced. It was like 
he thought there was something there, I guess. That's, that's all I wanted to say. Um, Anna. I think there were a couple of people before me. Um, okay, I'm very bad at the order of which hand. No, no, it's fine. I literally just raised my hand like one okay. second ago. Um, ben. Uh, yeah, um, like, so I'm noticing a, a kind of overlap between the, the, the idea of kind of narrative and the idea of self and how, um, you know, Isabella kind of spoke about how uh, it, it feels like he's coming up with all these characters, but he doesn't really have a story to put them in. And so he's just playing with these characters and, and also kind of the, the sense that there isn't a, there isn't like a, a, a narrative to his perception. And so that then uh, means that, you know, it, it reminds me of like a sort of protracted version of like the fear response, which is, I don't know what the heck's going on. So I'm just going to look around and I'm going to focus on this. And maybe that's a thing. I'm going to focus on this and maybe that's a thing. But it's not, it's not this sort of panicked version. It's this almost like sort of calm, introspective version of this trying to not not really having a way to hang all of these sensations together but but sort of just noticing all of the things around and and then maybe the sort of next level up of that is these personas that don't have any any organizing principle that are holding them together and then the sort of next level up version of that is him looking at his own work as a persona narrating on his own work and and so it's like there's there's never this sort of telos of what he's doing. There's never this sort of aim that he's going towards, and and that seems to be, be all the way down, all the way down to you know what what the heck do I look at? Um, and so it's it's both a kind of narrative and a, and a purpose, and and there's a there's a sort of purposelessness to both his sense of self, but also even within within the descriptions that the, there's a purposelessness to the to the questioning uh, of what to even look at hmm. paul you had your hand, your physical hand raised a little yeah <laughs> yeah i just i want to mention uh number 279 in the zenith book um i put it in the chat too it's it's a beautiful paragraph just sort of a lament by, from Soares about how somebody has left the office, they quit the office. And um, I think it's very revealing about his attachment issues. And I, I, you know, I think somebody like Isabella or some of the other folks that have good psychological in insight could look at this. But he doesn't, you know, he, he talks about when we get attached to things, when they're gone, even like something in our neighborhood, they tear down a building, or a neighbor moves away, maybe not even a neighbor that you know very well, or something like that, you know, it hurts us. And it hurts us more than we will say. And, you know, we we'll just won't talk about it. We just say, oh yeah, they tore down that building, big deal, it happens all the time. But he was very sensitive to those little changes in his life, um, both as Soraz and I think Pessoa. But that's what you uh, get when we're talking about the particular things that sort of he developed some lyrical little prose out of. And I think that's why so many people love to read him is because he will say, oh, the office boy left today. You know, things come and go and, you know, they come and go with me because that's something that, that was lost in him, not just, you know, the office or the business, something lost in him. And instead of not saying anything, he says something. And that, that's what I think resonates with a lot of people. So I, I'd love to hear what Isabel, if she can read that one, um, what she would have to say about it. But you know, I, I just wanted to bring that one out because I think it's a very beautiful passage. I wanna jump in and say something about that because that really helped me, Paul, to what I was trying to say to Isabella, which is that what you have in Pessoa is almost like a power to be traumatized or an ability to be traumatized, right? Where he like makes himself into the sort of person who can be traumatized by the slightest thing. Yeah. And that that's like a virtue, right? So it's like, 
the opposite of toughening yourself up. He's at like the other extreme, right? So like, yeah, maybe it was his, you know, these siblings that he lost or the death of his father, but maybe it's like he made himself into a site of trauma um, and such that he can in a way be attuned to like, there's an office boy who goes away. I, I wonder whether, you know, there's another passage about an office boy. I don't know mm -hmm. if it's the same office boy, about the, the greatest traveler I've ever known. Do you know this passage? Right, right. Um, where he says, he, so Paso is super anti-travel, which is one of the things I love about him because I'm anti-travel too. And uh, there are a lot of different passages and I I'm, I'm supposedly writing something against, I start, I wrote something for the New Yorker against travel and it was approved and then the pandemic hit and they were like, this is not the moment. <laughs> so <laughs> someday it might still come out, but like Pessoa, Emerson, Chesterton, there's a whole set of authors really who are super anti-travel. Um, and I think it's super interesting. Uh, so, so Pessoa has this passage about the only one great traveler I have ever known. And it was this office boy who collected maps and you know, um, tour guides and things from various offices. and. He never went anywhere, but he had sort of the idea of going to all these places mm -hmm. through and he put them all up and he's like, and Pacelle's like, I don't know what happened to him. I hope he never went anywhere because <laughs> he's like this perfect traveler. Um, and so I don't know if it's that same office boy, right? but it's, oh, there's almost a sense in Pessoa of the actual experience would be overwhelming. It would like be too much. I'm already traumatized. I'm already like just by the idea of it. So that, yeah, maybe maybe hypersensitivity would be sort of the right word. So he has that other passage where he takes a, a trip to um, Sintra, which isn't very far from Lisbon, you know, and it freaks him out. I mean, driving in the car, he's like, yeah, I can't do this. So yeah, it's funny. Yeah, he hated leaving Lisbon. I mean, he would go, yeah. his family members that he would go visit, but it was like very stressful. Yeah, he didn't like it. Um, Brian. I was actually not raising my hand, but um, okay. I'm really interested in this issue of traveling. <laughs> okay, Anna, I know, I'm, I'm sure Anna will have something to say about travel. First of all, it's so easy to be anti-travel when you live in a good place. <laughs> of course you're in Lisbon or in Chicago and you're like, okay, <laughs> not everybody has the luxury. <laughs> Wait a minute, where do you live, in Brussels? I live in fucking Brussels, yeah, well. It's not bad. <laughs> I moved here so I can travel. Um, and then the pandemic came. So, but that's a, that's for another salon. Um, I was actually thinking of, of Abe's question and kind of to push it to another extreme. I also just realized that I, I just swore on a, on a recorded intern act. So um, we will put a 18 plus um, sign on, on YouTube. Um, I, I'm wondering, okay, maybe this is going to sound weird, but like, why did this guy write? Right, you mentioned this, you know, this strong desire to reach out and kind of hug this guy, you know, when you read him, which I'm pretty sure was his intention, right? I mean, he was, you know, um, you know, he was he was creating some kind of a connection. But the, the phrase that's been in my mind throughout the um the conversation tonight is 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 controlled introversion. And and this way where, you know, if you actually have a phobia of people, which I think this guy did, um, and I'm not qualified to, to know why, but I think it's quite palpable, then, you know, writing or, 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 or in any way kind of controlling the means of communication is a really good way of, of kind of prescribing to other people how, can they, how, how they can reach you, right? Through reading and, and through uh, being, you know, moved uh, maybe by his words and, and, but, you know, I, I know a lot about fiction. I know how that would work in fiction, you know, that Umberto Eco would come and say like, oh, here is the reader and the reader fills in the gaps as, as you mentioned, but we're not necessarily dealing with, um, with fiction here. And I'm wondering, it's a little bit like Anais Nin and these really manipulative um, diary writers that, oh, I bear my soul, but I'm not really saying anything that's going to be helpful for you. Um, and it does this mean that he fictionalized himself is this, are we dealing with just self-defense here in various forms? Yeah, great question. I think that, so somebody, maybe it was Isabella brought up Simone Weil, was it you, Isabella? Uh, who said I didn't hear it? Oh, sorry. Was it you who brought up Simone Weil? Yeah, yeah. 
So like that's how you say their name. <laughs> I yeah. Um I I feel like there are these writers, he's like her. One way that I find to be like her is that is is a kind of extreme lovability. Like you read these, you read Vey and your heart just goes out to her and you're like, why did you starve yourself to death? Um, at the age of like whatever, 20 something. Um, these guys all have some kind of elementary suicidal thing going on, right? Exactly, these people are like, and, and but it's not, I think it's really not put on. Like, I think that, um, and I, I have a theory, which is that people who are in some way very charming and very lovable in their writing, often will make that's having some kind of problem connecting with people. I think the same is true of me. I think I'm pretty charming and lovable in my writing. People read me and they kind of like me. They like me even when I'm like deliberately being annoying, right? So I think like, I'm not at the level of Pessoa or Ve, but still people have that response to me. And I think it is correlated, right? So think about it. If you have trouble connecting with people, you become almost a student of connecting with people, right? you in a way become the expert of it at some level and you can deploy it in some context, probably better than other people because they're like naturally doing it in this other context. And so like, yeah, I think that this writing is incredibly, I mean, it's a really good way to put it, um, Anna, that, that he's creating a connection, that it's like he's reaching out um, and, um, you know, and it's not that he, what he, he had sort of, a, a, a very active, he was at the center of a kind of literary culture. Um, so, uh, uh, and some of it was a bunch of fictional people, but there were also some real people. Um, um, but that I'm not sure that introversion is the right word, introversion as opposed to extroversion. Um, it's somehow just like having a very different way of navigating social relationships than the norm, where that very difference gives you a kind of perspective on the social relationships and a kind of power that you can deploy in certain contexts, not, not cynically, not manipulatively. I don't think I'm being cynical or manipulative. I think it's just like I have a certain ability. That ability is born from a certain kind of social awkwardness. Um, so, uh, uh, and that's why I think for me in a way that the really interesting idea that I want to apply to Pessoa is the idea I want to apply to Schopenhauer of like depathologization. Like you might say, okay, there's something wrong with this guy. Like, oh, he had these disorders, he had trauma, he had, and I'm like, well, no, he's had these brilliant insights. I'm like, maybe he also had this bad stuff, but like somehow, you know, it, whatever, he was able to turn it into like a way of seeing the world that is sort of different and yet accessible, right? Um, and so part of the way for me that fits is into like the, you know, like, what does it mean to somehow believe in psychological diversity and heterogeneity? Uh, what does it mean except to not need to pathologize somebody who, who sees the world in a way that makes him profoundly sad? Like, that's also a way of being, you know, um, the, the word vulnerability came up in the chat and maybe it's actually controlled vulnerability, right? Mm -hmm. And also like your, your, your idea of uh, authors being or artists being really the opposite in real life versus their art makes me think like, is Michelle Welbeck a super nice person? <laughs> does, it, does it work the other way around as well? I don't know. But you kind of to stick to the Hungarian uh, examples, Corinthi has this short story where in the in the editorial office, two short story writers like kind of like hammering away at their typewriters, and one is this very suave, gen well craft gentleman with kind of a you know a rose in his buttonhole, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the other guy is this kind of brute with suspenders and beating away at the typewriter. And obviously, it's the big brute guy who is writing lyric poetry, and the little suave, well craft gentleman is writing a brutal murder dismemberment story. <laughs> and this seems to be a, this seems to apply to many things in life. Compensation. Um, Chloe. Um, so I was I was thinking about kind of the depathologization and ways of seeing the world, and I'm still thinking about the you know my skin and the skin of the pillow. Like that's quite a weird thing to say. Um, in the Chandogya Upanishad, so a text from like eight centuries BCE, there's a parable about blind-born sages. Um, 
touching an elephant. They make the elephant known to them by touching it and they compare its tail to a rope, its ear to a fan, things like that. And it seems to me that's quite a normal way of seeing the world and thinking about it. You compare what you sense to like a lifeless object, something that you can grasp pretty easily. And in this way, you can pass your sense experience and go about doing whatever. But it seems like Pessoa can't really do that. For him, it seems like everything else in the world is also a subject. There are no objects that he can just glance off. And in this way, you kind of get that sight of trauma thing. In, um, in the Book of Disquiet, there's a section called the Dolores Interlude. <laughs> And he says, every visible edge cuts the skin of my soul. Every object's visible weight weighs heavy inside my soul. It's as if my life amounted to being thrashed by it. And it makes me think that for him, the function of thought is not just to abstract and conceptualize stuff so you can go about your life, but to really over-ascribe meaning and subjectivity. Mm. Um, and I guess I want to say in this way, he is really, really different to D.H. Lawrence, who also lost a parent and many siblings to TB and other respiratory disease like Nottinghamshire Mining Town, because um, Lawrence does not do this. He even has phrases like, me alive ends at my fingertips. My pen is not alive. I cannot live through my pen. And I'm pretty sure Pessoa did live through his pen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not just that he lived through his pen in his own life, it's that writing and kind of um, literary culture was really like the lens through which he saw the whole world. He was obsessed with the idea of business and of starting a business. He tried more than once. He was extremely bad at it. So he tried to start a printing uh, company and he bought a printing press and it went, it went terribly wrong. Uh, and then he tried to start, the best one was this thing later in his life. He tried to start, oh, I wish I could remember the name of it. It was something like a Bureau of Portugal, a Bureau of Business for Portugal or something. And it was supposed to be this, this almost like a shopping mall that had like all these different businesses, right? Um, except that every one of them had something to do with writing. You know, it was like letter writing and books and, you know, and it was as though the only possibilities he saw for business were things that involved words. So it's not only his own experience, right, but everyone else's experience too, he saw as filtered through language in this really profound way where it was almost like he actually didn't get that a lot of people are not like that. Um, uh, and that have concerns in their lives that have nothing to do with like poetry. <laughs> um, uh, and um, so I think that that's, that's right, Chloe, that, and that, 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 that he's making everything kind of a subject and he's making everything kind of a poet almost. Um, he's interacting with the world as though it consisted of a bunch of other poets that he created. <laughs> um, uh, um, uh, but it's somehow there's something very weird about that, about conflating the pillow and a person, because it's weird also on the side of what you think of people, right? Like that is the other subject is in a way demo demoted. People are demoted by this way of thinking. Like things are promoted and people are demoted um, if you can conflate them. Um, Eric. Yeah, I kind of want to push back against the thing that you just said and the thing that Anna said earlier mm -hmm. about um, kind of intensely introverting or in controlled vulnerability and what you said about people being demoted to objects like the sense I got from this is a, a radical vulnerability that's an opening up and abandonment kind of thing like and he does this at the very beginning where he abandons himself to the idea that like, I'm not writing this for anyone. I'm writing this for myself. And if no one else is entertained or even read this, that's okay. But at the same time, it's just like, like you were saying earlier, the leaving the trunk and depending on other people, I think that it flips that where other people become real and 
I or Pezoa or whoever takes that demotion instead. And this is what I'm talking about with like, love makes this a reciprocal relationship where it's constantly changing whether I'm the object or the subject and whether you are the object or the subject. All of these things, like an, a word needs both a speaker and a hearer. And that kind of, rather than resting at one point or the other, the whole middle ground becomes that like fruitful space uh, of meeting without being or of not knowing and instead being where there's a ton of ambiguity and plurality, but it's also just the, the kind of uh, dialectic model in some sense, but just the, the dynamical part of it almost like only one half of it right I mean that is if he's like I don't even know if anyone's you know it's it's a very weird thing to do to have a dialectic where you're like in some way there's only one side of it right um uh Sean you had your hand up a minute ago yes that is true I did and then I lowered it but um <clears throat> thank you for uh recognizing that uh um, I've also been reading some Simone Bay, and although I've never read Pessoa, I, I see where the comparisons come in. And I'm curious to know, uh, she writes a fair amount about, you know, a, a, a blind man does not sense a stick, senses the world via the stick. Um, and uh, you mentioned earlier in the conversation that, um, or, and I just heard someone uh, referencing uh, Pessoa's maligning, the the pen is dead, and I there, there's nothing alive or carnate. And, and I'm, I'm wondering... Uh, you mentioned earlier that um, at sort of the dissolution of, of his sensory experience, how he, it's like he's not really going anywhere with it. And it seems to be very troubling to him, where in contrast to Simone Weil, she was a deeply religious person. Um, and, uh, and, and I'm wondering if, and I know this is not like a brand new idea, um, but d does he make any reference to God or um, anything of that sort? And if he does not, can we maybe assume that, you know, at the limits of a sensory experience where things do kind of dissolve senses of self, uh, illusory senses of self that, um, uh, that like where all of that breaks down, if there's, if there's no story uh, there relating to God or something um, similar that like the, almost like the only outcome can be uh, uh, challenges with one's mental health or um, like an infirm being in the world. Uh, I don't know if any of this is registering and I'm sorry, I'm kind of working out the thoughts as I speak here. Uh, one of the passages, um, uh, one of the fragments that I, I chose for you guys says, whether or not we believe in them, we are slaves of the gods. <laughs> um, uh, I think it's whether or not we believe in them, maybe it's whether or not they're real. Uh, I, I'm going off memory. Um, uh, and so I think that like, one thing is for sure, so I didn't think you could simply dismiss religion. Um, and I didn't think he, I don't think he could simply reflexively avail himself of it either. Of course, Simone Weil's relation to religion is not at all reflexive. It's very, uh, there's a lot of struggle there too, but, um, um, but I think you're right that, I don't know. I, so I, I don't have a, I don't have anything definitive to say, but maybe other people have thoughts about the religion issue. Anyway, uh, actually, Brian has had his hand up for a while. Oh, I think I just actually failed to put it down. Okay. But I am interested in this passage about the gods. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know too much about his um, religion, but that one reminded me of, again, going back to this like hemispheric split, which is like about the relationship between poetry and prose, which are kind of like, to me, related to attention and awareness. And um, there is this notion that I, I think um, maybe it was Han mentioned it earlier about um, poetry as like God, uh, as like a voice speaking through you or something. So I was very curious about just like whether he had a distinction in his mind between what he was doing in prose and what he was doing in poetry or whether um, it's kind of part of the same project, just like different manifestations of it. Um, I don't know enough about him to, to kind of uh, weigh in, but it was just a question I had. Mm. 
Yeah, I, here's a, a line that I, I just flipped open the biography that uh, this was roughly what I remembered. Uh, Pessoa lit no candles, said no prayers, and attended no services. He did, however, write a few prayers, usually in the form of poems signed by his own name or by one of his heteronyms. <laughs> you want to know Pessoa's view about anything, he dated someone to have a view about it, probably, right? Um, so it's like good luck figuring out what his own, what his own religious views were. Um, Paul actually had something on that, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I would say that um, Pessoa was an atheist, but it's a little bit hard to tease out. He's confident enough that he will invoke the gods when he wants to, and he'll ignore them when he doesn't care about them. So I don't, he's one of these, you know, Nietzsche, Santiana, he's confident enough that he doesn't really care what the concept is. If he can use it, he'll use it. But he was not a particularly religious person. Two of his poets, um, or at least one of them, Ricardo Rice, I th Reese, I think, was an Epicurean, which means he was probably an atheist. And the other one, Carrero, would, would reject the gods. So I'm not sure about Campos. You'd have to sort of look through that. But um, I would say he was an atheist. But it really was, doesn't matter. It, I think the concept is irrelevant to Pessoa. They use the gods when he wants, which is a good pagan, right? Eli. Sorry, you're muted. That wasn't me. <laughs> oh, oh, you you hadn't you you weren't intending to raise your hand? No. Oh, okay. Sorry, your hand is up. Uh, Anna. I'm just realizing that maybe this is dialectic. It's just more the the German kind. Like, oh, you have an internal conflict. Like, we can resolve this. Just create a create multiple characters. Create a create some kind of a mix. Uh, maybe this is the maybe this is the secret of a happy life. Just oh, you have a unresolvable, you know, desire or a contradiction. It's fine. Just uh, to have have the tableau of characters. Yeah, but I mean, it, it didn't exactly like it. I, it's not clear to me that. Like in one way, every time he creates a heteronym, it's a solution to a problem. Like to the point where you almost, he'll almost do something like he needs money and he'll create a heteronym who's rich. And you're just like, it's not how it works. <laughs> you're gonna get any money that way, right? But that there will be this thing where, you know, he'll like have some problem in his life and he'll like create a person who has solved that problem. Um, it's a pattern that recurs in his life, which is so weird. Um, um, and, and like, but like that, that is almost like, um, like it's, there's some very strange conception you have to have of the problem in the first place to think of that as a solution to it, right? Um, so, um, yeah, that's one of the, for me, one of the most mysterious things about it. Um, Peter. Yeah, just on this uh, God stuff, um, there's a moment in, in, I think, the first passage that you suggested for us, Agnes, which uh, he said something like, humanity is, is no more deserving of worship than any other animal species. Uh, and for some reason, this reminded me of um, Bernard Williams kind of uh, railing against Singer in his lectures on um, philosophy as a humanistic discipline. Mm -hmm. And it, it it sort of got me wondering about the, the just just before that that sentence there's this comment about I'm the sort of person who's always on the fringe and seeing not only the thing he's a part of but but also the spaces around it and th this sort of sense of possibility being you know very vi vi sort of inducing kind of vertigo um, sort of the ground and sort of the grounds for for choice for decision for commitment kind of fall away. Um, and it, it also reminded me of, um, <clears throat> yeah, sort of Nagel struggling with with sort of the objective and subjective sort of where you happen to be versus uh, something else. And I, I guess, I, you know, through as everyone's been speaking, I, I've kind of been wondering, you know, what, what's the source of this disquiet, like ultimately, um, you know, and, and is it of philosophical interest um, or is it just a, path a pathology? Um, 
that you know really he should have just done a bit more exercise and maybe taken some antidepressants um and then maybe he'd have said something more interesting and you know um i'm interested it's, it's funny just just as a final note sort of agnes you, you were sort of suggesting that uh you would like to sort of depathologize schopenhauer and nietzsche uh, as, uh, and so and so on um and that just it just occurred to me that that's sort of like the opposite of uh the move that sort of Nietzsche's making at the beginning of Beyond Good and Evil, where he's just kind of <laughs> going through, sort of pointing out all these pathological instincts that have, have like, you know, generated these these philosophies. Um, and so I suppose, you know, you, you could try to like depathologize, sort of say, well, any instinct goes, like there's, that any instinct might like give you some window onto the, the way, the, the nature of things, but, I guess Nietzsche would, would say, you know, some instincts, you know, are hostile to life or something, you know, it can't really be lived with. Um. Yeah, so I think you have totally put your finger on the issue right there. And like the question for me with reading Nietzsche is like this, this idea that there's something there, these, some instincts are hostile to life. I want, I want him to hear him talk more about the other ones, the non-hostile to life ones. Uh, and I find that those tend to be merely gestured at or metaphorically or something. And it's Nietzsche himself is guilty of a kind of resentiment in the sense of a, a negative theorizing, negative philosophizing, right? Where in a way, the sort of notional, whatever, the notional like warriors, you know, of the Iliad that don't actually represent anything like the characters. There's no one that represents the, the warrior good guys, you know, the original good guys before we look, we call, use the word bad to describe them, of the genealogy. Um, that there's a kind of, um, that really what Nietzsche is saying is we need to sort of like reverse, reverse the ressentiment, flip it again, and then we'll get to the right view. But that's itself a version of ressentiment, right? And so the, the, the question here is like, if you make the pathologizing move, is there some territory you have to retreat, you are you have available to you to retreat to where that's like the healthy good morality? Um, are you gonna have some word other than health, which is purely metaphorical to describe it? What is that morality? And I find that as much as I'm a huge fan of Nietzsche and I really get a lot out of reading him and engaging with him, I think he just collapses there. And I think he collapses for reasons that are actually given in a bunch of platonic dialogues that articulate this exact move. So the Gorgias and the Republic both have a Nietzsche character who essentially pathologizes morality and says morality is a kind of disease. It's a kind of, it's a kind of language, a kind of fake language that we use that covers over the real truth. And the people who are real men know that this is how we should really talk. And then you're like, okay, Callicles, okay, Thrasymachus, tell me, how should we really talk? What is the like, what is the healthy, what is, the, and it just collapses. It just collapses on itself, right? There is, they have nothing to say. They contradict themselves, right? Callicles goes from a kind of extreme hedonism to then just immediately like basically dumping that hedonism. Um, Thrasymachus says like, oh, the great ones are the rulers. And then he like a, a few pages later is like, no, 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 the ruled who rebel, those are the good ones. And they're, they're like lost, right? And I think Plato like, foresaw that there would be this movement, this unmasking move that, that Nietzsche does in one way, I mean, that Freud does in one way, that Girard does in one way, that Foucault does in one way, this unmasking move that was gonna like take over human thought where it's like, there's a, there's a big lie or something, you know, that, um, that we're all telling and I'm gonna tell you the truth. And then, and then you're like, okay, what's the truth? And they can't say it. It's like, there are no words to say it because all our morality words have like been taken over by the lie, right? And so I guess like I, I, my own feeling is that the only road where you get anywhere is depathologizing, is saying, what sense can we make of this? What, what forms of intelligence and insight and goodness lie behind the Christian approach to punishment? Um, or, um, you know, uh, Pessoa's um, like obsession with sensory detail, like Paka Josh, like, I mean, you know, there's a, also a weird way, which he's not, right? Um, but so that, I mean, that's just kind of laying bare my own, um, let's say like um, um, uh, 
the methodology that I've developed as a result of kind of like, you know, frustrating conversations with Nietzsche in my head where he will never tell me what he actually thinks or what the, his positive view actually is. Um, but I'm, cu I'm curious, I'm just gonna call on Josh like out of, um, uh, 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 you know, even though he's not raising his hand because Josh understands Nietzsche way better than me. And so he can tell me if what I just said was like a complete, um, revealed my own, my own ignorance about Nietzsche. Josh, what do you think? Uh. I, um, I mean, I think it's, I, I think it's definitely fair to say that there's figuring out exactly what Nietzsche views as a positive ideal for humanity is, it's very hard. Uh, and there are questions about sort of how much Nietzsche can say there beyond sort of really formal things like the should have values that we that are positive values rather than the negative ones or things like this. Um, I mean, I think it's one feature of sort of the way Nietzsche pathologizes uh, all the different value systems and things like this is that it's often compatible with that for him to to acknowledge that there isn't anything, there isn't any sense there's respect to sort of their way of looking at things is false. Uh, that this is, I think sometimes says that if you really wanted to see things as clearly as you as possible and as objectively as you could, uh, the way would be to look at it at the way, look at things the way they look through all sorts of different affects. Um, so then you would sort of see all the details that you focus on when you're looking thing, at things when you're dominated by one affect and also see the same details that you miss when you switch to a different one. Um, so I don't think, like Nietzsche's suggestion that a lot of those affects are harmful ones to actually reside in. And so it'd be much better for you to reside in other ones for sort of guiding your actual living seems to be compatible with him recognizing that a lot of those affects still actually do provide intelligible views about the world, uh, the affects that are better for living uh, miss out on. Um, so I think he can, to some extent, agree um, with the point that um, the fact that there's some sort of psychological root on his view of a lot of these views doesn't mean that they're just completely irrelevant, uh, but, but they're still sort of, in some respect, cognitively significant. Mm. So, so could you say, you know, that affects, you know, that perhaps support insight or kind of truth seeking may nonetheless be unlivable uh, or, or sort of at least like quite disrupting or something is that right so there's like the there's like value but but like a pra pra pragmatic kind of disvalue <laughs> right yeah that there are ways of looking at the world that successfully highlight details of the world that are missed by ways of looking at the world that actually are much better to occupy for your life and that it may be the case that it's important to be able to take up those other points of view sort of just so you can then realize that this is a really bad point of view to be in and that it would be really a much better situation if we can successfully enter other points of view. Um, so there's sort of a, I think to some extent sort of part of Nietzsche's comparative project uh, involves sort of recognizing that there is actually at least some sort of different substantive view involved in looking at the world from these different perspectives. One, one comment just okay. just to, to, to wrap on the pathologizing thing from, from my side anyway it's, it's just that um I, it, it occurred to me that uh people who have mental health trouble uh when they're trying to decide whether to, to take medication or not they often the move they actually need to make is to pathologize <laughs> uh is to stop is to like stop seeing um 
the, the experiences they're having as like deeply part of them or something um, in, in a way that is to be kind of accepted um, uh, or sort of, you know, lived through. Uh, and to be like, you know what, I just, I don't want this. Um, and so that that's sort of an interesting, well, th that's a lived experience of uh, going in the opposite, in the other direction um, from sort of acceptance to pathologizing. Mm. Yeah, I just add one, one niche uh, note here. I'm in no way an expert. I'm but you know, for instance, the um, the birth of tragedy ends with a coming to terms with the, the the opposites, right? With the music making Socrates and the kind of letting go of the either the purely animalistic or the purely um, rational. Um, so I, I do feel that this analogy would, I mean, as far as I know, would would work really well here. Yeah, if there's some kind of if there's some kind of synthesis, I mean, that's not usually the way I think of Nietzsche. Is <laughs> like thinking that we're going to synthesize all these things and get some benefit from all of them. Um, uh, so, I mean, as a way to deal with the with the the horror of life, right? I mean, that's what the whole um, the birth of tragedy is about. That it's unbearable. <laughs> And one way to uh, to kind of come to terms with it is by allowing these different people to populate you, um, because otherwise you will go insane, which he did, by the way. So maybe we 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 are at, in a better position to follow his advice. Um, uh, I think Elo, you were next. Yes, I want to just uh, just talk a little bit about the. Well, what you were saying about how this was all the unmasking of um, that was actually predicted in the Republic, or it was, was, and how this, and just try to, and there's something else that was said in the chat that basically what Persoa whispers where Nietzsche was shouting. Um, but I was, I wonder whether the project is actually doable because like for instance and i and I'll, I'll i'll be practical in that sense right you're talking about dealing and perhaps i am understanding how what was the project if there was a project at all in order for life to be unbearable like life is unbearable like, like anna said right uh, at least it was for him and he was creating all these personalities in order to make it to cope with it um and we all do that in different ways uh as when we procrastinate and we're creating personas other things are going to be we're going to do things in the future um or, or we're going to do we're, we're trying to create those sort of personas like wait i'm going to do this in the future is that that future me that is going to do that but that future me never comes to the realization of the actual me um but if you procrastinate on everything that you do um i don't think that's a workable way of doing things um because then you're pretty much gonna do nothing. Or if you create uh, things, you create personas that are like, it's, it's so unbearable for you to do something. And it's like, you know what, this me person is going to do it. Um, that's not, that's unworkable either, but in a way it makes it easier for on you. And what is the most constructive way? How can you make that constructive? How can you make that persona that you create do it constructively. How can you make that practical? That's that's, a, that's an open question. I'm I'm just wondering if like if psychologists or philosophers have thought about it and like how can you make that sort of of tool uh, of creating a person to do things in a way that actually achieves goals. I can speak to that quick, yeah. not on the, so I, I'm actually quite allergic to, to sort of, um, you know, advice giving or, or how to's or anything like that. Um, although I, I appreciate that you want something practical around philosophy and psychology. I think one of the things that is most useful about reading 
Nietzsche maybe and Pessoa is that there is no answer. And actually, I think that's more honest. And what we click with them is that there's an authenticity in the struggle and in the tension and in the trying to make meaning. And we feel a kindred spirit, like what you were talking about, Agnes, with this kind of the awkwardness that basically people just want to big hug with you eventually, right? And it's because the struggle is authentically being expressed and it's being done also, by the way, beautifully. So there's a language around it as well. As well. But there is, like, you can be frustrated with Nietzsche, Nietzsche because there's no uh, sort of solution. But I think that's the point is that none of us have that solution. And going to Silicon Valley for 12 rules of life or whatever it is, for me falls way more flat than these folks who are working it and feeling it and drinking their way through it and whatever it is. So that I, I think part of why, um, why there is something so important about these personas that he creates is that this is actually the voices in our head. He's speaking our, most of our truths, which is we all um, have these voices in our head. Some are louder, some are softer, and I'm not talking about schizophrenia or multiple personalities. There are stances, there are, are sort of the critical voice in our heads and so on. And so he gives voice to them and to some way playfully like sort of amplifies that he has 50 of them now, right? And that he can pull them in with agency and so on. So he does show us something like agency and a, a will to move around and pay attention through these different stances that actually I think is pretty good advice or modeling something that is kind of sense making out there. It's not as satisfying as somebody telling you like, here's the cognitive behavioral, you know, techniques that you can use to change your, you know, mind about this thing. But I think it's actually quite relatable. I'm gonna um, take Nigel's point and then Eloy's point, and then we're gonna wrap up. I'm gonna tell, I, I weirdly during the, uh, uh, during these last discussions, I had this like memory from my childhood that I'm going to tell you guys about that like will be a good wrap up point that I hadn't remembered for like 20 years. Um, oh, but Nigel's hand disappeared. Oh no, it's just it's still up, but it's, okay. I just took it down um, because you addressed me. Yeah, Thank you very much for all this. It's really stimulating. Um, I'm not sure about Nietzsche though, because I think there is there are elements in Nietzsche's writing which do point to um, a kind of existential Nietzsche saying, make a work of art out of your life, redescribe your life in a way that you could live it eternally in repetition. Um, one thing is needful to give style to your character, to your life, only in, as an aesthetic experience, phenomenon is, is the world justified to us. Though, you know, there are plenty of um, um, pointers towards something positive and it's not, I don't think it's fair to characterize them as entirely destructive. Um, but it's very difficult, as with Pessoa, to pin Nietzsche down because he's got all the different voices, he's got the different um, uh, internal debates he's having as well, and different personae. So, you know, you have the same, exactly that same sort of problem about what did Nietzsche really say? What did he really mean? Um, yeah. And he meant different things at different times, obviously, in different books. I'll just say a quick thing to that, which is like, I think that's absolutely right. I just, I don't always buy that aesthetizing shortcut. Yeah, that. Just say, it sort of is a shortcut. Leon Cass was a teacher of mine, very beloved, used to say, the beautiful is the skin of the good. Um, and there's this sense that like the aesthetic has to somehow point us to the moral and then Nietzsche never tells us how. Now you can disagree with that. You can say that's not what the aesthetic is and it has this kind of independence. And I think maybe the one plausible reading of Nietzsche is to really insist on the independence of the aesthetic. But uh, I sometimes feel like that's just a placeholder um, uh, of like, what is it to give style? What is it to, you know? Um, well, Alexander Neymas had a go. Exactly, yes. Writing a book to explain what that might be. Yeah. Yes, I, and I've read it. <laughs> but yeah. it was one of the very first philosophical works I ever read actually as a high school student. <laughs> um, Eloy. Oh, you didn't have your hand up. Okay, then maybe I'll tell you my final story before we wrap up, which is, okay, I had not remembered this for a very long time. So growing up, I spent, I mean, everyone spends a lot of time with their siblings, um, but I really spent a lot of time with my sister. Um, uh, um, so like when we, when I was 10, we started going back to Hungary over the summers, which is when we came here to the United States when I was six. 
And, but like me and my, and me and my sister would just go, right? So we were sort of, we were always with family and different family, but the two of us were always together. And it was for her, I think a little claustrophobic to always be with me. She's two years younger than me, but also my parents weren't like, they both worked, you know? So I was sort of in, ch- in charge of her. I was very bad at being in charge. So anyway, she, she just, she spent, she has spent more time with me than anyone. Okay. And, uh, and there was a time during our childhood when I, I invented this game which was that if she flipped over a coin, I would be this girl named Robin, this pure American girl, right? Not this Hungarian girl that I was, but this real American, which we both dreamed of being sort of real Americans as kids. We, we wore Hungarian clothing. We were, you know, we didn't have accents, but we were like weird uh, in the context of in both. And both in Hungary, we were weird. You know, we would go to Hungary and we'd be wearing jeans. Okay, this is like in the 80s. And like, that was not the thing to do because they were just too prized, right? So we were always out of sorts. But anyway, so this girl, Robin, was this American girl. She lived in Brooklyn, which for me was the most American place I could imagine. Um, And uh, I would inhabit and I would be this girl, Robin. And she behaved quite differently from me. And I remember the very first few times I did it, my sister was intensely annoyed. And she'd be like, stop it. I know you're Agnes. I know you're not. And I would be like, I'd be like, wait, where am I? What is, what's going on, right? Because I'm suddenly, I've suddenly appeared in the wrong place as Robin. And, uh, and she would fight with me and argue with me and be like, I know you're not Robin. And uh, over time, she started to like flip the coin herself to bring Robin into being. And after a while, she, it became clear that she preferred Robin to me. And she would just want me to be Robin and not Agnes. And when I sort of realized that, I like put an end to Robin. <laughs> I killed her. <laughs> it's like I could not take the fact that I had this in effect competition, right? Um, anyway, so that was my that was my Pessoan anecdote from my childhood that I had totally forgotten. Um, thank you guys so much for coming. This was really fun. Um, thank you for enduring my first attempts at being an inter intellect host. Um, And I hope to see you, well, some of you I will see in person, and uh, uh, if not, on another salon or whatever. Thank you so much. And I I saved the chat. Um, Well, you've already saved it. I have saved it. It's like 15 pages um, of of text. Um, This has been fantastic. Um, Thank you so much, um, I guess. I think, uh, and I I love the story. And actually, I I think... uh, you know, when, whenever uh, we spoke about how healthy it is to kind of embody your internal conflicts into whatever characters, I'm like, yeah, if you kill them, <laughs> if you kill them after a while, and it's he- it was healthy. Um, thank you so much, guys. I'm not, not of, uh, a lot of joy listening to you, and we hope to uh, hope to see you, Agnes, very soon um, again, and maybe at another salon. Um, have a lovely thank rest you. of the night, day. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Uh, I